Okay, good morning, everybody, and can I welcome you all to the 23rd meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Uh, can I remind everybody present to ensure that all electronic devices are switched off at all times because they can interfere with the sound system, uh, and I wouldn't like to have to give you a row in the middle of the hearing, so that would be helpful if you had them switched off. Um, can I welcome Liz Smith, MSP, who has joined us to, for today's first agenda item, which is a roundtable discussion on the Higher Education Governance Scotland Bill. Uh, welcome, Liz. Um, uh, we have no apologies from members, so Liam MacArthur unfortunately has been delayed by his flight uh, from Orkney, but I'm sure he'll join us soon. Uh, we have uh, unfortunately had uh, apologies from uh, uh, Professor Ferdinand von Brunzinski, who's unable to be with us this morning. Um, I'm first of all going to um, start um, with a, a few words, if you don't mind, on uh, the process. Uh, obviously, the Higher Education Governance Scotland Bill contains relatively few provisions. It's a relatively thin bill, but uh, has generally generated a lot of comment and interest uh, amongst the sector. Um, we have published almost 300 uh, submissions on our website. Uh, and can I thank everybody who's contributed? And just for the avoidance of doubt, can I tell everybody, because we have a lot of people who wanted to come along here today, that uh, all evidence, written and oral, is treated uh, in equal measure and is treated the same way. Now, the purpose of today's meeting is to allow us to obviously try and make some progress on the main issues uh, arising from the Bill, uh, but bear in mind we have obviously conflicting views, uh, and a number of them have obviously been expressed uh, out with this committee so far. Um, I'm hoping that everybody can get the chance to express their views this morning and make it clear their views on the Bill and uh, any changes they see fit uh, to suggest. Uh, you've all been notified in advance of a number of uh, topics, we want broad topic areas we want to discuss, so we'll try and uh, manage it so that we go through those three topic areas, uh, but obviously it does, they don't cover individually all of the things I'm sure members and uh, contributors want to discuss here this morning. Um, so I'm going to encourage hopefully some free-flowing discussion. I'm quite happy to take um, uh, comments from across the, the round table this morning. And I'm also quite happy for uh, uh, contributors to question each other. So I know that I'm not sure if, if um, both sides of the argument here, in a sense, have been in the same table and around the same table yet. But maybe this is the first opportunity. So if, if you want to discuss certain issues, by all means, please contribute. If you want to question somebody else's uh, submission or evidence, then please do that as well. I will try and allow that as much as, as possible. Um, but I want to start with the first general topic that we sent you in advance. And that really covers the specific measures set out in the bill and asking whether they will rectify perceived weaknesses in higher education governance that have been identified certainly by some participants here today and by some of the evidence that has been sent to us in written form. Now, I think it's, it's fair to say that um, uh, all those with a, an interest in the, uh, the sector considers that higher education institutions um, should be fully effective in their governance arrangements. There's no argument about that. But there obviously is some disagreement about how we move forward in terms of the detail. Um, it's also fair to say that the written submissions um, from a number of bodies, including HEIs, uh, are not clear what the problems that are currently exist within HE governance that the bill is seeking to address. However, others have quite clearly laid out that they believe there are deficiencies in existing practice in a number of agencies, such as transparency, democracy, and in fact to do with uh, pay and diversity issues. There's a number of issues I'm sure you've read the written evidence. <clears throat> in order to get things started, I, I want to start by bringing in those who think there are perceived problems and uh, difficulties and ask them to lay out why they think that's the case and why they think uh, uh, the bill should be taken forward and what they see as the, the merits and perhaps some of the problems with the bill if they see some, some changes they'd want to see as well. So can I start with Mary Senior, if Mary, you want to outline some of your views, um, I'll then come to the NUS, Emily, and then I'll bring in chairs in the universities uh, before I bring any members in. So I know members are keen to get in with questions, but I'm going to bring in our, our guests first and let them uh, lay out some of the ground rules uh, for the discussion. Uh, Mary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak to the committee uh, this morning. Um, I think for UCU, this is about addressing a perceived disconnect between staff and students and those at the top. I think it's about ensuring uh, decisions that universities make are scrutinised, that there's robust 
governance uh, and that those that work in, and, and learn in universities, indeed I think we're very clear that universities are about education, learning, research, knowledge, uh, knowledge exchange and the people that are involved in that are staff and students so it's, it's really vital that they feel connected uh, to the key decisions and the strategy that the university um, and the higher ed education institutions are taking um, forward. So that's why we're very supportive of, of most of the recommendations um, in the bill today and indeed we were very supportive of the von Prondinsky report which was undertaken after a very thorough review of higher education governance um, in, in Scotland and this bill uh, seems to address a number of those issues uh, including the election of a chair of a governing body and ensuring adequate staff and student and trade union representation on governing bodies because we feel this will enable uh, staff and students to, to better influence um, the, the decisions that are coming forward uh, from um, the governing body and have a say in how uh, this moves forward. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mary. Emily? No, you don't have to. Don't, don't touch it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, certainly speaking from NUS perspective and our, our members' broad support for this bill, I think I'd like to focus on, on the principles that we believe are behind this bill and really uh, move away. Hopefully, this conversation can move away from, from the hyperbole that's often been put out in the press in the past few weeks. And certainly the areas that we feel are lacking in governance at the moment are more democracy, increased transparency and diversity on our governing bodies. I echo what Mary said. We believe that, that universities are academic communities and those stakeholders of, of these communities are staff and students primarily and they sh absolutely should be the ones leading the discussions and leading the decisions that are taking place within our institutions. And that's why we feel such, um, such aspects of the bill like the elected chairs um, and other aspects that we would like to, to introduce as well, like uh, quotas for boards, are really crucial to us, and our members are supportive of those. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now, who from the, the, the university sector or the chairs would like to contribute? David. Thank you, convener. And again, I join with my colleagues in thanking you to invite us here today. We see this as a, a bill which um, is looking for, to some extent, is looking for issues which are already addressed. It's worth bearing in mind, convener, that the code exercise creating the SE code of 2012 and 13 went to every university. It talked to students, it talked to staff, and it identified what they wanted gov good governance to look like. As a result, 94% of universities already have two elected members of staff in their governing bodies and 70% already have two students in their governing bodies. Our perception is that the danger with this bill is that because it doesn't build upon the good governance which already exists, it, and it introduces solutions which we think will positively damage good governance, such as accountability, we believe that this bill will set back the, the sector's ongoing process of ensuring good governance. And so, whilst entirely unintended, the consequence of this bill will actually be bad for a sector which contributes £6 billion a year to the economy and which, in international league tables, as recently as last week, five Scottish universities are in the top 200, three are in the top 100 in the world. Good governance is required to achieve that level of success. So we believe that in saying that this bill carries dangers, we are, we are, st we are stating what is actually the case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Sharkey. Well, thank you for letting me speak. And I just wanted to say uh, I really enjoyed coming to Scotland because of the huge support that uh, the, the government has for higher education and for culture, which I think is fairly unique in the world. Um, the The intention of the bill and the goals that everyone is talking about, we absolutely share. We want demo democratic governance. We want transparency. We are a small institution, and indeed around this table we have one of the largest institutions with 50,000 students, and one of the smallest, my own, with 1,000 students. Uh, I believe that um, we, we have uh, students on our governing board. I meet with them uh, on a regular basis. They were involved in the appointment of me as principal. Uh, as, a, as an entire small institution, um, our submission has been that we feel that uh, all uh, concerns are listened to. Uh, we're a small enough institution that we can work within the code to suit the uniqueness of being small, whereas a law would require us to do some uh, difficult manipulation uh, in order to be compliant with the law. Uh, so we, we feel, as, as a conservatoire, we're serving the democratic goals and intent um, very well and want to contribute to creativity uh, and innovation as an arts leader. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
Can I, uh, Professor O'Shea, can I bring you in at this point? Yes. Uh, thank, and thank you very much for inviting us. I'm in a simple, similar position uh, to Professor Sharkey. I came back uh, to Scotland um, uh, because of the environment. I have experience of three major universities, um, being a, a senior in the senior management, the Open University, the University of London, and the University of Edinburgh. Um, and the environment here has uh, been very, very positive. There's been a really good partnership uh, between the Scottish Government and the universities uh, since devolution. It has, it has been very productive, and uh, one consequence of that is I serve... Uh, the German government on their excellence initiative to give them advice on how to improve their universities and have been deputy president of the French government's Investment dans l'Avenir, something very similar. And this partnership between the Scottish government and the universities, this has given us innovation, it has given us creativity. In the case of my own university, 47 new companies just last year, 47 companies created, and it's given us international links uh, which have cultural benefits and economic benefits. And the, it's very hard to perceive the, the governance problem here. We have got a very good code of governance. We are uh, refining it. Um, I'm, I'm in an environment with two students on the governing body, five, uh, five colleagues on the governing body, three alumni. And the anxiety that we have in the university sector is that there are some very serious unintended consequences here. Um, if this legislation goes through in the form that we see it in front of us, it will not only weaken the autonomy of universities, but it will weaken the perception of, it, of the autonomy of the Scottish universities. And as someone with a lot of international links, I find myself in the embarrassing position of getting letters from university presidents from other countries commiserating with me, because this is not... This discussion isn't just happening in this room. This discussion is being observed around the world. And the perception around the world is that this bill, if enacted, uh, will reduce the autonomy of the Scottish universities. In the case of the University of Edinburgh, it will weaken the accountability of our vice convener. We have a very good dual model, a rector elected by all the staff and students who presides at the court, and a vice convener who's appointed through an open and transparent process to the, to the court, um, and that dual model has, work, works enormously well. We have a Senate, a historic Senate, more than 400 years old, uh, which is large, 737 members on it. It's got uh, substantial student membership, substantial non-professorial membership, and it is highly effective. It, it promotes uh, very serious debates and initiatives that come from the students, that come from the not that come from the non-professorial staff, go through our Senate and get adopted. Again, if this bill goes through, we will be asked at Edinburgh to disenfranchise, to remove the democratic rights of five, six of those on our Senate at the moment. So I have to say, we've, the partnership is such a success story. Between, at the moment, Scotland has proportionally more universities in the world, top 200, than any country in the world. The University of Edinburgh does better than any German university, any German university. Uh, and when one looks at the, you know, and there are obviously unintended consequences, but when one looks at the unintended consequences, they will undoubtedly damage the autonomy that is vital to success. And in your own briefing notes from SPICE, the, the OECD uh, documents that are cited there are extremely clear on this point. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to come back to uh, Robin, if you don't mind. Robin, could you give us a contribution? Yeah. Um, the first thing I think I want to say is that uni universities in Scotland are very well managed. And I think we should be clear that this is not about the quality of the leadership or the staff. I've worked in the sector for 13 years, and we're blessed with a, a, you know, a very large number of good people. What I think, the pro I think the problem lies with this is the assumption is that democratic debate within the university system should take place only in its governing body. So once you've got a governing body, that's the only site where the future of an institution can be discussed. Now, I don't think that's helpful. Universities are generational institutions. They are not institutions which are run for 10-year periods. They're, universities which are, they're institutions which are run for 100-year periods. And we don't really have a mechanism which allows most staff, most students, um, a way to discuss the purpose, the future, and the strategy of the university. Now, I personally would go further. I personally think we should go to a fully democratically or stakeholder-elected court. 
and have that discussion as something which is undertaken by the whole university all of the time as a community. I think what this does is it gives you an immediate focus whereby in the electoral cycle, people can stand as, um, for, uh, as candidates for the governor of a, of a university, of a chair of a court of a university, and in that process, people can hear what they think the view, their view of the future is. And different views of the future of the university can be discussed and can be debated in an open forum <coughs> with staff and students. Now, we've seen, um, we have excellent managers, excellent leaders in our universities. But one of the things we've seen in recent years is when you have a governance model which selects too many people who are too similar, good people make bad decisions. There is very little evidence that suggests that less diverse governance is better governance. And an enormous amount of research which has been taken around the world now about organisational development, which suggests diversity in your governance is not only um, normal nowadays, it's helpful and it's good. And particularly things like ensuring that you have a right for staff who understand the university, um, bits of the university better than managers do, to have a role, an automatic role in the governance of that university in every university in a steady way is important. And I do want to pick up the point about autonomy. Um, We've got to be clear here the difference between autonomy for a university from government and autonomy of a small management group from everybody else. Now, I don't see that there is any way that you're saying um, there should be a democratically elected element of the governance of a university, but it's for the staff and for the students to make the decision about how that demo democratic outcome uh, occurs affects the autonomy of a university. It may affect the autonomy of a senior management team, but it doesn't affect the autonomy of, of a university. Um, I, I don't see that. I, I don't understand what the unintended consequences are. It seems to me that we already have elected leaders of university courts, and it works very well. It should be something which is systemised across the university sector to create a focus for debate about what universities are now and going forward. Uh, Anne-Marie. It's very interesting, uh, the points you make about um, the general direction of universities and perhaps your perceived lack of involvement. Um, certainly at Harriet Watt, when we devised our last strategic plan, this was a process that involved every student and every staff of the university. Our student union were around the table on every occasion. But it was a broad consultation. We particularly consulted on the values of the university, the vision and the mission of the university. The Senate has a key role to play in that, hearing the voice of our academic colleagues, where they want to go in terms of uh, excellence in learning uh, and teaching and research. The code also, you know, certainly um, from, from our university's point of view, we are... Uh, very supportive of this code. We have appointed a principal recently and we've appointed a chair of court, both uh, since the code was published. And particularly for the appointment of the principal, the uh, requirement of the code to consult and get the views of all members of staff and all students of the university uh, was fully fulfilled. And we got some excellent feedback from our students and from our colleagues on uh, those key issues of direction of the university. You know, the students did, were not shy in expressing a view about where they felt the future leader of the university should take the vision and mission and the delivery of that. So I think universities are much more inclusive uh, than perhaps is perceived. I think the code helps us in that respect. It uh, requires us to be much more inclusive. And I think there's a fantastic spirit and embracing of the code across the university. And with my fellow secretaries, we're all working very hard to ensure that we do that. But the inclusive collegiate nature of a university has always existed. It underpins the existence of a university, and that is a day-to-day -day, uh, activity in our university. Thank you very much. Uh, Dame Jocelyn, do you want to... Um, thank you, Chairman, but I'm not a university representative. Just want to make that absolutely clear. Um, I'm president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh from the 6th of October last year. This is the anniversary. Um, I have a number of relevant roles, but I'll start with what I haven't done. I've worked for the Open University in Scotland, but I have not otherwise been an employee of a Scottish university. And I regard the Open University as a national university with a Scottish arm. I have, however, uh, been involved with universities in England, in Ireland and in the USA. 
I've held governance roles in three of them, being a staff member in one on their, what they call council court, uh, being on senior management role, as a senior manager role in another council, and so on. And I have appointed three vice chancellors, one of them in a Scottish university. I have a strong international reputation. I'm frequently invited to lecture abroad, receive awards and things like that. And I want to start by addressing some unintended consequences, which for me are really scary. Starting about the time of the referendum, but picking up momentum now with this legislation, when I'm abroad, I find people saying to me, what's happening to the Scottish University? What's the government there doing? With the implication that there is interference not quite articulated the implication that there is suppression of critical thought. That is not a word that you want to get abroad. That will be devastating for the SNP and the Scottish universities. But it's growing and it's out there already. So please, everybody, take care. I also want to say a little bit about the Irish universities because I believe that uh, what was proposed here has been modelled on what happened in Ireland. The Scottish universities are fantastic. They lift Scotland in a way that you don't see in many countries. The Irish universities... It's a bit sad. Muted. Trinity College Dublin has a fantastic history. Full stop. The Irish universities are not lifting Ireland. And I think a lot of that is due to bad decisions arising from curious governance arrangements. I would urge caution in that respect as well. I think that's perhaps as much as I want to say at this point, maybe when we come to some of the other questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And Jennifer? I'm Chair of Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen, and I wanted to pick up the issue in relation to diversity. And again, we share um, with others that a diverse <coughs> governing body is one that is effective and one that we would all seek to achieve. Through the new code we have, through across the university, made different commitments. We certainly, RGU, made a commitment to 40% of gender um, within the next two years. It's challenging. We're an 18-member um, board, 12 are independent members, four staff and two students. So we have been taking steps in our recent advertisement for um, new board members to be very clear that we're seeking diversity. We've agreed that we will pay um, in terms of expenses to cover any costs or loss of earnings to ensure that we are more open to a wider range of, of governance and board membership. So in terms of our commitment to getting a diverse board and a diverse governing body, we share that a diverse body is and will support good governance in, in the future and it's very much enshrined in the code and the commitment across the university and higher education sector. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think everybody's uh, now had a chance to speak at least once, uh, apart from members of the committee, so I'm going to start to bring them in, and I've got uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, um, I just wanted to ask about um, an earlier point that Mary Senior raised, which was the disconnect between staff students and those at the top. Um, in preparation for today's uh, session, I had a look at one of the, the universities um, in my area, and I had a look at who was represented on a number of the committees. And there's 10 committees, um, and there are four committees that have no student representation or no obvious staff representation. They include the Audit Committee, the Investment Committee, the Remuneration Committee, and the Risk Management Committee. And my first question, I've got, I've got three questions. My first question is, is why would there be no representation on these committees of staff or students? And is this typical of all higher and educational institutions? My second um, question would be, should students and staff be represented on all committees? And, and my third question is more specific. It's about remuneration committees themselves. Um, the Committee of Scottish Chairs 
uh, issued a guidance note on the operation of remuneration committees. And it says, effective governance is vital to the success of Scotland's higher education institutions, and the remuneration committee is an important part of that governance framework. The rep and then it goes on to say, the reputation of higher education can be damaged by pay packages for senior staff that are perceived to be out of line with pay and conditions elsewhere. Now, the NUS highlighted that the relationship of the lowest paid member of staff and the highest paid member of staff was 16 to 1 on average. This institution that I looked at from their own Freedom of Information request that they answered last year was 19 and a half to 1. And looking at the progression in one year from 2013 to 2014, the number of staff went up by 1.4% but the number of staff being paid over £140,000 went up 18%. And I'm just wondering if, you know, sh is it acceptable for the pay ratio between the highest and lowest paid members of staff to be so high? So my three questions are, why are there no representations of staff and students on all committees? Should staff and students be represented on all committees? And is it acceptable to have a staff pay ratio of 20 to 1 between the lowest and highest paid? David. Uh, I'm happy to take the, at least the first, structure, first two structural questions. I don't know which institution you're talking about. It doesn't matter. The question of who's on what committees is a question for the governing body. And on the governing body, there are staff and students. Indeed, in my own institutions, there are six members of the academic staff, there are three student representatives, and there are two elected employee representatives. So, they, in fact, we have become the last university in the UK to have a lay majority uh, when the regulations were changed very recently. And there is a broad spread of representation across governing bodies. So it's up to the governing body. What I would say uh, is, is relation to audit, for example, there is a very good argument for not having too many members of the governing body on the audit committee, because I regard my university's audit committee as the policeman. They're the people who look into what's happening and tell us, and really, you've got a balance to strike. You need to, not, need to know enough about the university to be able to understand how it works, but at the same time, you've got to be so distant from the university that you're prepared to take a completely different view. The investment committee, I don't know what it does. I actually chair the investment committee at my institution, but the people who are on that are completely external to the university. They are professional fund managers who are providing expertise on investment matters. We report to the finance committee who have staff and students on it. So it is very much a question for each individual university. The Scottish chairs take the view that the staff and students are and should be involved as fully as the governing body think thinks it's appropriate to be. And that's what defines, so, and the, the second question, as a matter of course, should there always be staff and student? I think the answer has got to be, what is the committee doing? Because we're looking for expertise, but all of these committees, I believe you will find, report to the governing body on which there are staff and students. In relation to principles pay, the, the, the reality, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that the funding council imposes on us the members of the governing body, not the university, the obligation of sustainability. It's paragraph 17 of the financial memorandum imposes on us personally. We have to run the institutions in the best way that we think we can. That means that there are people who are paid at different rates. There are people who some members of the public think are paid too much. But we have got to fulfil our obligation of securing sustainability. And the evidence is, as Professor O'Shea and others have pointed out, we are doing that. So I think it would be quite wrong to impose some standard multiplier which would reduce the accountability of the governing body for securing the sustainability of the institution. Yes. yes. I could come in on the actual operation of remuneration committees and the code has really helped us in this respect. It has given us much more guidance about how remuneration committees should operate. For example, it's required that the chair of court no longer chairs that committee um, and we have implemented that. It requires that we have a co-opted independent member who is not a member of court with the expertise that David refers to in the area of reward uh, informing the decisions around that table. The terms of reference of the uh, remuneration committee are agreed annually by the court. Uh, there are, of course, data protection issues here that we have to uh, guard carefully, but at least in my institution, the full court, including our staff and students, receive a report of the reward levels 
granted it's in bands, uh, but they are fully informed of all of the decisions of the committee. In addition, pay in universities is really well publicised in vice-chancellors. There's a, a league table of vice-chancellor's pay, which appears uh, every year in the Times Higher Education. Um, it, is, it uses very sensible benchmarking data from UCEA that the whole sector uh, uses. And uh, in addition to that, uh, in our published accounts, all of the salaries are openly displayed there for uh, everyone to be aware of. The new guidance from the Committee of Scottish Chairs has also been warmly welcomed. It's very new. It's only a couple of months old, but we are well on the way to adopt that as well. So I think uh, governance is a, an area that evolves uh, over time in all organisations, not just universities, and we are particularly moving forward in opening up the transparency around areas such as pay, which we understand are sensitive. Thank you very much. Very senior. Thank you, Convener. I think Gordon MacDonald raised three very good questions and really helped to uh, illustrate this disconnect that uh, staff and students feel uh, from those leading universities. Um, I think no one is questioning that Scottish universities are, are not good because they are, but I think what we're saying is they could be so much better if staff and students and trade unions were fully involved in how they operate. Um, a number of people have commented on the uh, governance code which was introduced um, over the last number of years. Um, I'd really like to remind the committee um, that trade unions and students weren't involved in the uh, initial stages and in, in certainly in terms of the drafting of the code and it was only when um, we gave evidence at this committee um, with Lord Smith and pointed out this anomaly that we actually got to meet um, those that were drafting um, the code because again we felt that, 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 that there was this um, real um, disconnect. Um, in terms of the reputation of the sector in Scotland, uh, my colleagues um, in England and Wales and Northern Ireland actually look at Scotland with envy in terms of um, the commitment to education and the interest in governance and the fact that we uh, have this desire to, to do better, and we see that as a very uh, positive thing. Um, in terms of principles' pay, I think we still have concerns about transparency. Uh, when a principal in Scotland can get a 13% pay rise while staff are getting 2%, and we have no reason or no explanation as to why somebody is getting 13% where the rest of staff are getting a 2% pay rise, um, that's a difficulty. Uh, in previous years, a principal got a 24% pay rise while staff were getting a 1% pay rise. And again, we did not get the explanation as to why um, that was happening. Um, UCU does a regular freedom of information request to universities to ask for the minutes of remuneration committee meetings to try and get a sense of uh, why uh, principals are being awarded the, the, the pay rises that they are. I have to say, uh, Scotland tends to do better than the rest of the UK, however, it's still um, not great. Uh, two thirds of Scottish universities, HEIs, refuse to provide full details of the committee that set their principals' pay, and actually, four refused to send us uh, the minutes and all we're asking is for an explanation uh, as to how uh, decisions are made about uh, the salaries of those at the top. Um, you know, I think it's important that this um, is uh, looked at and is scrutinised and, and really that goes to the nub of why um, this bill is important. Okay, thanks. David, do you want to come back on that? Two points. First of all, correct a matter of fact, as the SPICE document on this matter reports, convener, staff and student were represented on the working group I went to a meeting with the previous Cabinet Secretary and, and Alan Simpson, who sat on the Von Perninsky report, and Ewan Brown, and the previous Cabinet Secretary suggested to us that we should have a rector or ex-rector on the working group to represent staff or student. That is the basis on which Spice, how I understand, have made the comment, which is correct, that we had an ex-rector, Simon Pepper, the former director of the World Wildlife Fund, who had been a very successful rector at St Andrews University. We thought at that stage that we were proceeding as requested to ensure a staff and student representation. And the other point I'd like to correct is that when the code exercise was carried out and we went to, every, no, I didn't personally, but the consultants went to every university, Students and staff did not press to be on remuneration committee. In fact, a number of students said expressly they didn't want to be on remuneration committees. Mm -hmm. okay. Emily. Yeah, 
I'm sorry, David, I think that's that's just wrong. Certainly the, the examples that I've heard from members and, and my own example, uh, we'd been fighting for many years at Aberdeen to, for students to, and staff, trade union members, to be on remuneration committees. And it was only in my last few days that I was granted observer status. And I have to say, from, from being in that meeting and being in that forum, it is, it's a much different atmosphere and you have a much different ability to challenge and to take part in the decision-making than just seeing merely seeing a report that comes through the governing body. That's, that's very different difficult to challenge in those settings. And I think it's uh, there's some great examples of best practice from colleagues here. Anne-Marie mentioned some and Jennifer some others. But I think it, it's worth noting that there are other examples of institutions that just aren't doing these, uh, these self-regulatory um, measures that were in the code of good governance. And that has failed to result in real tangible changes that we wanted to see from this, from this um, document. And, and I think that's why that legislation has come to this point. OK. Uh, Robin. I think there have been improvements in transparency, and I think that's true over recent years in governance. But that's only one of three principles that I think are at the heart of this. So the ability to know why other people made a decision is quite useful. Um, I think there's a fundamental principle of diversity. And one of the problems that we've seen is that, from my recollection of 13 years in the university sector, the people who are appointed to remuneration committees are almost always high pay. So what you're talking about is three people and £100,000 plus salaries are appointed to a committee to decide what another person's £100,000 plus salary should be. Now, that's one kind of person making one kind of decision. Diversity enables you to have a discussion with others who say it's not about comparing what you think is normal, but comparing what this institution as a whole thinks is normal, including staff and students. And there is dismay year after year about some of these decisions, and it never changes. But there's another element to this. So you've got a diversity element. But there's also a democracy element. So let's say these decisions are bad. The university as a whole, who is able to stop that decision? Who is able to say, no, we don't think this is a good decision? Is it only the university court, the university governing body, which has a, a, a majority of, generally has a majority of lay members, which are largely appointed? And if you profile them, they're not going to be low pay people. So it's about the, it's, it's about the, um, th this range of principles which should under, underpin good governance. Transparency is important, but so is diversity, and so is some sense of more than accountability. When you have a, when you have a large community like this, it's also about democracy and the ability to say, who is it in the end who owns this university? Is it owned by its staff and its students, or is it owned by 20 people in a committee appointed without the wider university uh, community having any automatic right to have any say in who these people that make that decision are. Now, again, this is not about ill will. This is, we've seen this in the banking sector. We've seen this in a whole load of sectors. If you put a lot of people who come from exactly the same background in a room and ask them to make a decision, you can guess what decision they're going to make. Good decision-making comes when people have to debate across people who come from different directions. And I know that students have been actively excluded from some controversial decisions in universities. And that's not good. Students may be younger, they may not be as experienced, but they're a key part of the university community and their voice isn't an add-on. And their expertise may not have come from 50 years in the financial services sector, but they have a whole other kind of expertise, the expertise of what it's like to be a student in an institution and what they think the priorities for the institution they're in as well. That expertise should be valued too. And unless wait, wait, voluntary consultation is not good enough. It's not, because as we know, you consult when you want to and in the ways that you want to. If you do not empower diverse voices to have a say in how universities are shaped, they will continue to be shaped by a small self-selecting group, and it's not healthy for governance. OK, um, I, and there's a number of members want in now. Um, can I bring in uh, Tim first, uh, followed by uh, Professor Sharkey, and then I'll bring in Mary Scanlon and then Liz. Um, thank you very much, Stuart. I, I just ju want to straightforwardly uh, contradict uh, Robin. Um, our um, court on it has five elected staff, two elected students, three elected alumni, and is presided over by a rector who's elected by our staff and students. Um, it, uh, it, that provides a route uh, for all sorts of debate. Our Senate uh, route always now meets uh, discussing some large thematic um, topic to which all members of the university community, regardless of their status, regardless of whether they're academics or not, uh, is invited. 
Uh, it is a very open system, and I will give, just give you some examples. There was, we had a student-led campaign to divest from fossil fuels. Um, and obviously this is something where we, there would be differing opinions from those on the investment committee, differing opinions from those uh, who are engaged in petrochemical engineering, and differing opinions from the students. Um, there was a ser series of debates. The senior vice principal chaired a group that included academics who did research on fossil fuels and students. And as a consequence, the university court ended up uh, with a divestment from fossil fuels. Now, that was student-led and highly participative. When the Scottish Government announced its business pledge, our university straight away said we will adopt all elements of the business pledge, including the living wage. And that was, again, d involving a broad-based position within the university. Led by academics in our sciences areas, we, w we have been working very hard on gender equality, and a few days ago we were delighted that the institution of the University of Edinburgh as a whole was become one of seven universities in Britain uh, to be given Athena silver status. Now, these moves, the, move to, the moves on gender equality, which started in science and engineering, the move to divest from fossil fuels, uh, inevitably they did not come from as it were, some parts of the university. They came from some other parts, and yet within the University of Edinburgh, through our Senate, which, which has debates which allow the whole university community in, through the open discussions which I have with all staff and all students, through our court meetings, and we have an annual court meeting where all staff and students can address them. We have a number of fora, and if you just look at the last year, there are a number of very clear examples where you know, the University of Edinburgh took a leadership in divesting from fossil fuels, and who was leading that movement within the university? It was the students. We've taken a leadership in gen gender equality. Who led that? Well, actually, it was our, uh, to start with, it was our academics in chemistry. So we do have these mechanisms, and it, this is not rhetoric. We, I can give you, these are tangible examples, and these involve serious debate. It wasn't straightforward that somebody said, oh, let's work on gender equality in science, and everybody said, yes, let's do that. Or somebody said, oh, let's divest from fossil fuels, and the whole of the investment committee said, sure, and Begora, if that's what the students want, we'll do it. These involved long, careful debates, and they ended up with the university, after these long participative debates, making moves uh, which the university community as a whole says, right, we have divested from fossil fuels. Right, we're going for gender equality, particularly in, in science and, and medicine. Jeffrey. I agree that universities should be held to account, and there are a variety of ways uh, that this is being done and continues to be. For instance, we're hosting the Widening Access Commission. We're really looking forward to coming up with innovative ways to get more young people engaged in drama, in music, and dance. We want to try to influence the uh, school's curriculum because that influences the kind of student that we can take and educate. Um, we absolutely agree in diversity and transparency, but a one-size-fits-all legislation could actually be hurtful for a small institution such as ours. Uh, I mentioned these art forms. On our small board, uh, we have to make sure that they can help lead us through troubled waters for cultural institutions and education institutions. We need expertise in the acting profession, expertise in music, expertise in dance, and expertise in production. And indeed, we have members that are part of the Musicians Union, or Actors' Equity, or BECTU, and that's as important to them as some of the other unions that are discussed here. We have good relationships with them, but if we had to create space for all of them on the board, we wouldn't actually necessarily get some of the expertise we need to function and flourish uh, in the world. So uh, I, I, that's the, the bit that I'm concerned about. We need to be held to account. There are measures to do that from our outcome agreements, the Widening Access Commission, uh, coming to committees such as this, the Code of Good Governance, which has its review coming up. Um, but a legislation that tries to treat us all the same when the sector is so different, uh, we would find challenging. Okay. Just before I bring Mary in, um, can I just confirm then that your opposition, if you like, or your concerns, maybe is a better, better way of expressing it, your concerns about the bill are around the, uh, your perceived lack of flexibility um, in the way that it would be implemented. In other words, it's a one, as you said yourself, a one-size-fits-all is not something you want, but if there was greater flexibility for institutions, then that well, would be... That is among our concerns, but even the thought of having to find a cultural leader if you're the leader of the RSNO or you're the leader of the National Theatre of Scotland, you're identifying a small selection, a pool of people that 
have a sympathy to the culture and a way to lead that. We're as much a cultural institution as the Glasgow School of Art, as we are an educational institution. So having it open to an election, we think would politicize it with a small p. Would we get an actor? Would we get a musician? Would we get a dancer? It would take our eye off the ball for delivering on, on the creative agenda and the innovation agenda and actually be hard for us um, to, to be compliant with that law. It would make things more difficult. Yeah, sorry, if, if, therefore, if there was a, f I mean, I, I use this loose description, but if there was a sort of fit and proper person test for those who could stand, in other words, if there was some way of saying th these are the kind of people we're looking for, and then people from who fit their criteria, as you would with a job application, could then apply. That might make it easier, but I'd have to see the details sure, of what yeah, you're I'm just, talking I'm, about. Yeah. I'm just raising it as an issue. Uh, Mary. Uh, I would just like to uh, raise three points that have already come up in discussion, but not to go over what we've done. But looking forward, um, the Code of Good Governance, um, the policy memorandum, uh, paragraph 13, states that uh, the SFC, when making a grant, uh, making a payment to all higher education institutions to comply with principles of good governance, uh, which appear to the SFC to co constitute good practice, um, their memorandum sets out requirements with which higher education institutions must comply as a term and condition of the grant. Now, my, my question, and it's just my first one, is that all the issues that have been raised today could they not be part of the governance of the SFC in terms of handing out the grant? Is there anything that's in this legislation that cannot be included in this code of good guidance? So that's number one. And number two, given that I've never been surrounded by so many learned people, uh, <laughs> I'm not underestimating my colleagues, uh, MSPs, but I thought, convener, I would take advantage of uh, all the professorships around the room. And um, I would like to ask, um, again, it's po uh, paragraph 63 in the policy memorandum, the definition of academic freedom as expanded explicitly includes the freedom to develop and advance new ideas and innovative proposals. So I would just like to ask, uh, what's stopping you developing new ideas and innovative proposals at the moment? And is this going to be corrected by the legislation? And while I've got the floor, my final one is can I, number. Can I bring, it's just a final I'll bring two you back seconds. In. I'll bring you back. It well, was a very it, quick. It's the same answer. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay. I just want to ask my learned friends if they could explain paragraph twenty in the bill. Scottish ministers may, by regulation, make such supplemental, incidental, consequential, transitional, transitory, transitory or saving provision as they consider necessary or expedient for the purposes in the Act. So I wonder if they could tell me what that means, because it seems to me that they can just jolly well do what they like yeah. if this bill is passed. Yeah. Yeah. And that's me finished. That you finished. I'll listen carefully to the answer. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll to be honest, I'm surprised by your last question, because... And in, in, in my 13 years here, it's been in every single bill. Ancillary regulations and provisions have been in every single bill I've ever seen. Words. Yes, they have. Oh, I think so. <laughs> um, I'll, bring, I'll bring in who wants to come in and answer some of the questions that Mary's raised. Then, did you want to, Mary? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, convener. Um, in relation to the code of gov good governance, I think so many of the issues that we're raising were not in the code anyway. Uh, you know, the, the code doesn't allow for elected chairs. The code doesn't allow for um, trade union nominees on governing uh, bodies. Um, and the code doesn't address issues um, strictly enough around remuneration committees. Uh, you know, I think the bill is a more holistic approach to, to really connect staff and students more effectively um, in terms of the um, governing uh, governing body um you know i think we, we, we're all saying that the sector is a good one and you know i don't want to sit here and and point out all the problems and all the um difficulties that the sector has faced but um you know i'll just give you one example because actually it's a sort of example of how things could work in a positive way uh, because it's about the university of aberdeen uh, which has a rector 
Um, and it's about an, a, a time when the, the rector actually has asserted her right to chair court. Um, court was facing a decision that the senior management team wanted to make 150 compulsory redundancies. They wanted a very short window uh, for a voluntary severance scheme, a couple of weeks. Then they wanted to move to compulsory redundancies. Uh, at that court, um, the rector enabled a full debate. Um, and actually, court said, hang on a minute, let's pause, let's scrutinise these decisions. Uh, and we, we then had a voluntary severance scheme that was extended. Uh, we had more consultation with the trade unions uh, and with students. Uh, and we're working that situation through, rather than court making um, a, you know, a, a really drastic decision very quickly without effective time to, to scrutinise. And that was because um, the rector, who doesn't always chair, but actually on this occasion a Asserted her right to chair, you know, took the chair, and staff and students who sat on court were able to um, to challenge that. And so that's what this bill does. Um, you, you know, it it, it allows uh, more robust governance and scrutiny and transparency um, and accountability. Um, and then your your second question was around um, academic. Uh, freedom. And I think what I would say, the bill helps to strengthen uh, and give clarity to the definition of academic freedom. You know, we've got a good definition in Scotland that came from the 2005 uh, Further and Higher Education Bill. You know, I think the additional clauses that are in there actually help to give clarity um, and strengthen the, the definition. You know, UCU has on occasions been asked to defend uh, some of our members around questions of academic freedom. Uh, and I think the bill is a positive step forward. OK, thank you very much. Um, Liz. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I wonder if I could uh, just uh, set out some uh, issues that relate to uh, the possible reclassification of the university structure. I was very interested in what Dame Jocelyn Bell said and also uh, Professor Sharkey in the way that uh, the international dimension is so important to our institutions, particularly ones, uh, Professor Sharkey, that may have a great diversity in that. Uh, university Scotland uh, presented a case to the Finance Committee two weeks ago uh, which indicated that there would be a very considerable detriment possible if the uh, universities were reclassified as public bodies. And that, in their workings, has come out as close on a billion pounds. That is very significant. The Scottish Government uh, responded last night, uh, but not with any accuracy about what their workings are, um, because they haven't yet produced them. Uh, could I ask you as to whether that's the concern that you're finding from international sources uh, that this would not only have uh, possible effects on the way that you work, but also on the funding of our top-class institutions. Dean Russell, do you want to? I can't comment specifically on the funding. Um, I have concern that universities should not be classified as public bodies. Sure, they get some public funding, but it's far, far better for universities if they are more independent and are not classified as public bodies. Um, I think that's all I, I need to say at this point. Okay, I, I, I think a number of members, Robin first and then Gordon. I just want to clarify here that I was um, public affairs manager for University of Scotland for 13 years. We took legal advice in this. And the legal advice that we were given was that universities have always been public bodies. They're not public sector bodies but they're defined as public bodies. Mm. And as far as I can gather, the entire basis of this claim relates to whether um, universities would lose charitable status or not. And as far as I'm aware, I've, so I've been out of the country a lot in the last three weeks, so I think I missed it, but as far as I'm aware, that's been put to bed by Oscar. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm, I, to be honest, Robin, I don't think that's correct. Is that not? I don't think that's correct. Okay. Okay. But sure. Liz, could, Liz. Can I just answer that point that there are two completely separate issues, actually. The charitable status uh, issue, uh, which Oscar has made a ruling on, that they probably would not have any effect on that, so you're correct on that point. But when it comes to the uh, reclassification, the ONS reclassification, that's a completely separate issue. And there is very great concern uh, as to what that would do, because that would make them into uh, public bodies of a very different nature than they are uh, just now, uh, University of Scotland has presented uh, a very articulate and very detailed uh, set of uh, figures about the damage that this could possibly do. We heard from Professor Anton Muscatelli at the same committee what it would do to Glasgow University as one institution, and I'm sure the uh, principals uh, who are represented here can say exactly the same about uh, their institutions. So what, what I'm asking is that you know, if, if it is the extent of the concern of this financial um, inability to do things that they can currently do, 
uh, surely that is a very major concern in this bill. Can I just, well, just, um, there's a number of people going in, but I just want to uh, say to those who are raising the issue of, of the ONS, I mean, uh, do you take any comfort from the Scottish Government officials who said on the record, and I, I just want to quote them, we deem reclassification to be a low risk. However, if as a result of a wider ONS review of universities there were any risk of reclassification, we would take what measures were required to ensure that universities were not reclassified. There is absolutely no intention on the Government's part that reclassification would be an outcome. It is something that we would seek actively to avoid. Do you take any comfort from that, that statement by the Scottish Government officials? Uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just asking those from the sector whether they think that they're, they're for the... Convener, just yes, give David, one example. Sorry, yes, You'll be aware of the prospective project in the Western Infirmary site in Glasgow, which is where we have 14 acres of contiguous ground and a half billion pound investment programme. If we get into a limbo, which is what that suggestion it would mean, then that project will just stop dead. No one is going to deal with us commercially or otherwise if they don't know where we are. So I can't take comfort from it. Okay, uh, I, I said Gordon would come in. Just on that very situation and regarding funding, I'm just trying to understand the situation. The SPICE briefing uh, provided to us for main sources of funding says that university sector, all 18, is £3.2 billion, of which £2 billion is public sector grants and fees, £747 million is private sector, £144 million is charities, and £317 million across all 18 uh, institutions is uh, other income. Wh where is the danger of, within that range of, of funding streams, where is the danger that you perceive um, to the university sector, bearing in mind you're getting £2 billion of public sector grants and fees? Can I follow up? Because well, can I just, I mean, there are others. I know Professor O'Shea was shaking his head earlier. I don't wonder if you wanted to come in. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the danger is at the moment that we have charitable status. And, and having charitable status allows us to deal with uh, philanthropic um, support. It allows us to borrow. Um, it gives us a whole range of things. And if that charitable status... We just had a discussion because Robin raised the, the, the point about the ONS and the Oscar issue. Yeah. And I think it was clarified quite rightly by Liz that these are two separate issues and Oscar had clarified position. Yeah. You've now answered a question about what well, we're talking about ONS reclassification with an answer about Oscar. Yeah. Convener, may I just clarify yes, what was and this is on the record from the uh, Finance Committee. Uh, in the University of Scotland, uh, an intimation to that committee, uh, which is now, uh, as I understand it, convener on your own website, it is very clear the breakdown uh, of all the possible impacts uh, from uh, the reclassification of ONS. Now, the Scottish, the Scottish Government uh, last night uh, put out a letter from Angela Constance uh, to the convener of the Finance Committee uh, trying to uh, clarify that, but it doesn't have the details that answer the specific concerns that the university sector has uh, on these sums that are intimated within uh, the University of Scotland uh, letter. And I think it's, it's that issue, as I understand it, within the sector that is causing uh, the anxiety for exactly the reasons that David Ross uh, set out and Anton Muscatelli set out at the Finance Committee that certain projects within universities yes. can't go ahead. I'm trying to avoid, I think like you, mixing up Oscar and, and ONS, the charitable status stuff with the ONS reclassification, which are two separate issues. I think that's what I'm trying uh, uh, Sorry, Chick, you were waiting to come in. Good morning. So I feel somewhat depressed by this. They were still in this a conflict situation, a pardon conflict. I mean, change is a constant. So I'd like to address a couple of things <coughs> on that. A, yes, the universities need to be de democratised. But I say firstly to the unions and the students, when I look at the in informed participation levels, that you know, democratisation means harnessing the votes and the input from all students and all members of staff. I also say to the boards that uh, we need to look at the appointments of some of the people who apply or who are appointed to the boards, and there has to be a much more thorough uh, appointment process and review process of those that are appointed to the board so that there are no bug and stun or appointment of friends. 
but I think only on that basis. And I've run companies in Europe, uh, and what I'd like to do is, is ask the question, uh, what conversation has the chairs or students or unions had with the European universities and how they're governed? That's the first thing. The second thing is, I'd like to understand how you communicate the outcome agreements and your strategies with the wider community in terms of what you're trying to do. I mean, last week we were talking uh, to university representatives about their international involvement and how they translate their products uh, you know, and take equity participation in the products and so uh, generate increased funding, as they do, for example, Stanford University in California. It seems to be you know, a total lack of communication. This is a perception, a total lack of communication between the court and the students and the staff uh, at the level that there should be. I'm not saying there isn't any, but at the level that there should be, so there is total engagement. Just as you have in a company, and, and, and clearly the court have to select its leader, but in any company, the board has to go to the shareholders and tell them what the hell is going on. And I don't see this happening. Now, if it's a perception, correct me, but that is the perception that people have, is that there's a bubble. And nobody else with that bubble really understands what's going on. Now, if that's unfair reflection on the students, the unions, and the board, then tell me I'm wrong. If I'm not wrong, tell me what you're going to do to change it. Uh, thank you. I'll come in Anne-Marie and then Geoffrey. I, I wanted to first you to address the Buggins turn uh, remark that you made. Uh, I think that has been uh, left in the past by universities, uh, certainly at my university. Um, I've been there for five years and at the one I served in for ten years as secretary before that, uh, that practice has uh, long since passed. We have defined roles for members of our governing body. For the chair's role, uh, the court and wider than that, student members, staff members were consulted on what that role should be. And the principal's role description, the entire community was consulted, staff and students, on what that role should be. We have a very clearly defined skills matrix, which we publish on our website, against which we uh, recruit our governors. We recruit using an open advert process. Um, our diversity a few years ago was not what we wanted it to be, less than 20%. Today, 54% of our court are female. We shouldn't forget that there are more uh, protected characteristics than merely the gender point that uh, tends to be focused on. Um, and we are rapidly moving on to look at the rest of the protected characteristics. Um, we shouldn't underestimate the value of the effectiveness reviews which are contained in the code that's been published. That code requires us now, as universities, to conduct full five-yearly, externally facilitated, the results of which must be published on our website to all of our stakeholders, effectiveness of our uh, court and all of the committees of court, our Senate and all of the committees of Senate. So we can't conduct those reviews ourselves, we need to bring somebody else in to do it. So the level of transparency in both appointments and reviewing our effectiveness the effectiveness goes further. There's a midpoint review required and there's an annual assessment required of each court of its own effectiveness, which we must discuss with our students, discuss with our staff and publish across the university. So I really would like to say that we've moved on an awful lot in terms of appointment and looking at how effective we are. Many universities, because the code is relatively new and that requirement is relatively new, we won't have gone through that full cycle yet. But I would uh, say that... Given time, this sector will certainly demonstrate its commitment to looking at the effectiveness of its governance and improving it. Thank you. Jeff, uh, uh, Jeff, just before you do, uh, before I do, Jeff, can I just ask you to also pick up the question from Mary Scanlon earlier um, about the Code of Governance and, and its role in this? Just to respond to Mr. Brody, that mm -hmm. um, we instituted an annual general meeting uh, where any question can be asked, but more to the point, uh, we invite stakeholders externally, all the arts companies, we have our students, we have our staff. Uh, the agenda is open. Uh, in my very first one, we started to talk to lay the groundwork for a strategic planning process. And then again, because we're a small institution, 
in groups of 20 over cups of tea and scones, we were able to talk about the values of the institution, where we wanted to take it. And I think if you came to our institution and perhaps other, uh, such as uh, GSA and we heard at Harriet Watt, you'd, you'd feel there was a lot of inclusion um, in thinking about the strategic direction and the steps needed to be taken. And I'm frankly going to need every staff member and every student to be uh, working in the same direction to lift up the arts for this country. And on Mary's point about the Code of Governance, whether or not that it can be dealt with through the Code of Governance. And I can I, well, I think it's, it's related to what I said before. I think there are some measures in place uh, that, that can hold us and do hold us to account. Uh, our outcome agreement is debated and discussed at our academic board, which has a wide cross-section of uh, staff and student representation. Um, and I think there's probably more that could be done in there uh, in a constructive dialogue with higher ed education institutions. Okay, thank you. I've got a number of members who want, who want to come in. I'm going to bring them in. But I want to uh, 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 to kind of slightly move on. The, the Cabinet Secretary wrote to the committee very recently, um, and in that letter, um, tried to, I think, assuage some of the concerns that have been raised about the bill and also began to outline where possible amendments could be made to the bill to try and deal with some of the questions that have been raised. Um, I'm sure you've seen it. So I just wondered whether, in moving this discussion forward, uh, uh, whether people are, um, if you like, uh, does it assuage some of the concerns that were raised that letter? Does it, it you know, give you some comfort that the, the Cabinet Secretary is already beginning to think about possible amendments to try and deal with some of the issues that have been raised? Or... On the other side of that coin, does that worry you? And I'm looking over here at this, that there, there may be um, changes that, that would water it down from the, the kind of impact that you would want it to, to see in the bill. Uh, so I can just ask, leave that there, and if people can maybe start to discuss some of that stuff. But I want to bring in uh, um, Liam at this point, and uh, I know that he's been waiting to come in. Liam. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin, and apologies uh, for my late arrival due to travel disruption. And just on that point, I mean, it occurred to me that in terms of the reassurances, which I, I think are, are, are well-intentioned, part of the problem from reading through the papers um, that seems to emerge in those raising concerns is, is less the intent and more the scope of the provisions that are in the, the bill. And, and I think confirmation on that point, particularly in relation to ONS, we will presumably look at the scope rather than simply the stated uh, intent when making any uh, judgment. But the other point, I think, is, is more in relation to the, the genesis of the, the bill at all. I mean, obviously, um, there's been quite a bit made of the, the, the amount of public funding that our universities receive, which varies enormously, as you'd expect, in a varied sector, but is significant for, for all. And therefore, there are funding levers to achieve um, the outcomes that, that, that ministers in this parliament wishes to see. Um, there is the threat of reputational damage. And, and um, Tim O'Shea gave an example recently the divestment, and I think that the, perhaps, um, however kind of cathartic the process might have been, the threat of reputational damage was probably very much in the minds uh, of those responsible for making the decisions there. And therefore, I think as a committee, we should be reaching for legislative levers only when there's a demonstrable need to do so. So, I mean, I, I would be interested, I think, following up Chick's question about the international comparators, not simply the rest of the UK, but the international comparators um, that have been made in terms of governance that would give us confidence that, that our world-class uh, reputation can be uh, safeguarded through this, this process. The other, I think in terms of academic freedom, just picking up Mary Senior's point, um, clearly there's been a, a, a challenge under that and, and, and comfort may be sought, but it would be interesting to know how many successful um, cases uh, in relation to academic freedom have been, have been brought and therefore require that additional clarification uh, or tightening up of, of the 2005 legislation um, that uh, we've been, we're been asked to, uh, to uh, sanction through this bill. Jennifer, can I bring you in at this point in terms of uh, some of the comments that Liam's just made and some of the stuff that we've been discussing? Yeah, so I can't answer the, on the European question in, in terms of, but um, Tim can. Can I, and, and I mean, I, I, we definitely would, from a kind of governance perspective, support that legislation should be used where it's most appropriate and good code of governance, good accountability through outcome agreements should be the appropriate route to ensure across the whole sector that good governance can both be demonstrated, that it is transparent, it is open and it is progressive and it is fit for purpose for a modern, successful um, Scottish higher education environment. So I think in terms of governance, well, I mean, one of the key issues from a, a, a board perspective and a chair's perspective in terms of the legislation, it's a specific point about 
the election of chairs is how you hold the, the governing body to account. Because we do sign up to the outcome agreement. We take that responsibility very, very seriously. I, as chair, am responsible to my governing body. As a result of the code, we now have an independent governor who assesses my performance on an annual basis. That's discussed without my presence. If I'm not doing my job, if I'm not accountable to the body, if we believe there's an issue, then I don't continue in that role. So there are checks and balances through the governance code, and there are checks and balances in terms of both broader diversity and, and broader actions in terms of the community. On the point of communication, I guess, I mean, I think that's an interesting point about how much we do. Certainly, RGU, a lot of the communication is cascaded down through the senior leadership team. Um, we have student partnership agreements. We have probably less visibility as a board. Um, we're small in number across across the whole body. So that's, I, I think, something we definitely could, could look at, the concept of an AGM, for sure. But I think in terms of the legislation versus governance, legislation where it's required but where good governance can be managed through outcome agreements and, and the governing body held to account is what we would definitely support in terms of continuing success within the sector. Okay, thank you. Tim. Um, um, Chick and Liam have both asked the very good question um, about the, the attitude in continental Europe. University of Edinburgh is a member of the League of European Research Universities. That's the top uh, 21 in Europe with the one Scottish member. We're a member of Coimbra, which is um, essentially the European Ancients, and we're a member of the European University Association, which essentially is, is all the European universities. And if you look at the documentation from Liru and EUA, you see an unambiguous admiration for the situation that exists at the present time in the United Kingdom. The reason why uh, we are, the universities in the United Kingdom are so successful compared to universities in other parts of Europe is put down to our, our autonomy and our ability to operate. And if you, say, compare the situation with some of the German lender, where a university may not uh, borrow without... Um, and may, you know, there are all sorts of inhibitions. And for, so from the European point of view, the explanation of why... <coughs> does the United Kingdom and Scotland do so well. Um, it, re it really goes straight to the autonomy, and I would really want to echo Liam. Um, I don't... I mean, legislation, when it's not necessary, I would really counsel against that. And Mary asked three very good questions to which she knew the answer to, which is... Uh, well, so I'll give you the answers very briefly and then come back. So, the, so yeah. the conditions of grant, you're quite right. It's very easy uh, through outcome agreements and conditions of grant for the funding council to control universities. Academic freedom would not be altered uh, uh, by what's in the bill. But the key point that you raised is the business about secondary legislation. If this committee chooses to hand to some future minister of, of whose persuasion uh, we know nothing such far-reaching powers, then at the moment you do that, that is such a powerful thing that that is why outside Scotland the perception of the, of the attack on university autonomy, that is what has caused it, the provision for secondary legislation. And I'm going to make a personal plea to, to the committee. You, we've got something that works very well, this partnership between the Scottish Government and the universities. Please pause on this legislation. We could, we've got a very positive vector in terms of the Code of Good Governance. We would be very happy to come on an annual basis to this committee and give you a report on further improvements. We recognise we're not perfect, but on the other hand, if you look at the increase in student representation, the increase in open consultation, we would be very happy to document that for this committee on an annual basis if you would just pause the legislation. Because if you go ahead with this legislation, it is A, it's unnecessary, and B, it's too powerful, and legislation that is unnecessary and too powerful will be seen correctly as a reduction in the autonomy of the Scottish universities. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, convener. Good morning. I've just got something uh, that's going over in my head all the time. You know, basically we've got a billion pounds worth of public money going into these organisations. Now, we're talking about, well, it's a billion from the SFC. Uh, so we're talking about the fact that uh, 
tr about transparency, democracy, how we can move things forward now. The universities are telling us there's nothing to see here, everything's wonderful, uh, we don't need to do anything else. But there is, if you're a, someone from the outside looking in, you could uh, have the situation where Robin said that you've almost got a network of people who are giving each other cricket score salaries, you know, and there's no accountability there to the public pound there. So what is wrong with the idea of uh, local u universities actually representing the communities they're in and also the communities, uh, the university community itself? What is exactly wrong with that, to give that openness and that transparency so that we can actually see this through? To me, it looks like it'd be a, a good way to be able to collectively manage the university itself. Now, please correct me if I'm totally wrong in that situation, but to me, that looks like the way forward. Uh, Anne-Marie. The code is very helpful in this respect, and uh, I'm sure uh, the chairs will thank me for saying this, but it brings absolute clarity that the court and the chair themselves have to take a lead role in engaging with all stakeholders across you know, local communities, our students and our staff. So the code has given us the opportunity to do that. And I think, as Tim has suggested, uh, do we need to legislate to take that further? I think, no, we need to have some time to demonstrate full engagement with a whole range of stakeholders. Uh, students and staff are right at the top of our list, of course. You've heard something of the uh, inclusive nature of our governance. It is evolving. I think we can evolve it further. Thank you very much. Um Dame Jocelyn, you wanted in. Thank you. Uh, I suspect I'm the oldest person in the room and perhaps know some history. Maybe not. I don't look it. I don't look it, but I'm a lot older than I look. When, when Granny was a, a young academic, vice chancellors were paid typically 10% more than the highest paid professor. And then the government said, Your governing bodies are incestuous. Get some industrialists on. So the university's got some industrialists on, and the industrialist said, hey, vice-chancellor, you're running a £50 million business. In industry, if you ran a £50 million business, your salary would be yay high. And the vice-chancellor's salaries went up. You can't blame them for that, but it maybe was an unintended consequence. End of history lesson. Um, Royal Society of Edinburgh is particularly concerned about the enabling legislation, particularly about the items that are set out in regulation. And as everybody round the table will know, this gives powers not only to SNP ministers, but ministers of whatever government, colour of government there is in the future. Conservative, Labour, Liberal, Green, Black, White, whatever. And... It gives those ministers powers to do all sorts of things without Parliament scrutiny. I think that is a far bigger governance issue than anything to do with the universities in Scotland. Can I, Jocelyn, um, just for absolute accuracy, of course, ministers cannot do that without coming to Parliament. Regulations would have to be brought to Parliament and agreed by Parliament. So ministers do not have absolute authority to change willy-nilly as they see fit. That isn't actually how it operates. So, actually, there would be parliamentary scrutiny of regulations and there would be a parliamentary vote on regulations. Just for right. clarity. Okay. I'll bring in, David, I've got a number of members who want to come in, so uh, Mary first, Mary Senior. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, on the question of European examples, you know, I think there are some very good examples, and I would encourage the committee to uh, perhaps bring Ferdinand von Prondinsky to a future session. I think it was unfortunate that he family bereavement means he can't be here um, today, but I think he could speak in more detail around that. In relation to the ONS reclassification, you know, no one wants universities to be reclassified, and I would encourage the committee to look at Unison, uh, the trade union. Uh, evidence because they address that point there and, uh, and again I think there's a danger of sabre rattling on this issue to, to some extent because um, the sector does uh, receive a substantial amount of public money but actually it receives more uh, money from other sources which is one of the key issues around ONS uh, reclassification um, and I think uh, part of the reason why the bill as currently read looks like it has significant powers to Scottish ministers um, is because the cabinet secretary wanted the sector that is principals, chairs, trade unions, students to be able to come together uh, to work out a consensus for how we move forward on elected 
Scottish chairs. Uh, and if that actually was in the legislation, rather than saying it gives powers to Scottish ministers, again, uh, I think, would that give comfort to... Um, uh, to some of um, the people that are, are concerned um, around, around that. Um, Liam asked me about academic freedom and cases, and you know, I, I'm not sure that I can talk in detail about some of the cases that we've taken because it's generally ended in a mutually um, a, a compromise agreement or that, or that sort of uh, way forward. But I think it's more important in terms of underpinning um, academic freedom and what it actually means and how it should play out in the university sector in what is a challenging uh, time. I think, you know, universities have got the new prevent legislation coming in. And I think uh, one area where certainly UCU has agreed very uh, strongly with University of Scotland is how academic freedom um, is very important in how we deal with uh, other issues like prevent um, in the university sector, um, you know. But and Tim made his plea to the committee. And I think I, you know I would make a, an equally strong plea that the committee do enable this legislation to go forward because it can make a big difference to how institutions operate. You know, I think it's important that we do shine a light on some of the uh, poorer decisions that universities have made, and um, you know. Edinburgh is a great university, but you know we've had some questions there too um, in terms of the proliferation of zero hours contracts that we saw there, you, you know, a, a, a few years ago. You know that that was something that uh, you know need, needed to be um, addressed. Um, you know, why is a university in Scotland uh, having questions over its campus in Scotland and looking to open new campuses in London? You know, all of these are questions that we think could be more effectively scrutinised by the governing body. Uh, uh, with uh, elected uh, staff, uh, student and trade union nominees on court, which uh, would uh, be more effective. And, you know, I think the bill is flexible. It, you know, it recognises the diversity of the sector. Um, you know, and, and I think one of the other uh, problem areas that I would um, highlight was uh, the situation a number of years ago facing the Edinburgh College of Art, which was a small specialised institution and uh, poor governance, you know, let the institution down and fortunately uh, the University of Edinburgh was able to come in and pick up the pieces. So all institutions, whatever the size, whatever the nature, uh, need to have this collegiate approach to uh, governance, uh, which I think this bill can provide. Thank you. Uh, Robin. Very quickly to say that the European University Association is a ranking of autonomy of universities and Scotland and Britain as a whole is the, have the most autonomy of universities anywhere in Europe by quite a stretch. So, you know, a tiny, tiny tweak, moving it a tiny, tiny bit, even if it did, still leaves the most autonomous universities in Europe. And one of the things which I think is quite important is if you're going to talk about international experience, the Ivy League in America. The, the American universities have much more collegiate governance systems, and I don't think anybody's going to say that they're not successful. And I, I really want to come back on this point. I can't understand the ferocity for saying, Tim, you're right, that was a great example of the disinvestment campaign. And it's a very good reason why we should ensure that every university has a democratic right for staff and students to be able to help the university. And I think it's a right. It's not something that should be given by a group of um, managers when and they, they feel like it. And this, there's, I, I can only stress this again, there is so much fascinating research being undertaken around the world just now on what is making an effective modern organisation and what its governance looks like. And the same thing keeps coming back again and again when you bring the expertise of people who are stakeholders within an organisation, from all parts of that organisation, when you bring them in as a matter of right, and not as a matter of grace and favour or patronage, when you bring them into the governance, you get better governance. You get a more diverse debate. The zero contract is an excellent example. Um, you would have uh, trade unions, you would have staff and students who would take a different view in this, potentially from other managers. And again, you won't find many forward-looking institutions um, in any sector which are not now looking at new governance models which enable and empower their internal stakeholders. And I don't understand the level of resistance to this modest change. Uh, thank you. David. A question a moment ago, convener, and in response to that, just deal with two points which have been raised. Um, I, you are, of course, entirely right about the operation of the regulations and the powers of that, but possibly because of my vulgar previous trade as a corporate lawyer, I know that power can be exercised in a number of different ways. Section 8 would allow the Scottish ministers to decide there's going to be a new category of a member of court. 
And that is someone appointed by the Scottish ministers. They could determine there are going to be 15 of those. And under our arrangement with the Funding Council, we can't have a court bigger than 25. So the Scottish ministers could determine and could bring forward regulations, convening you're entirely right, saying you've got to have 15 people appointed by us, you've got to get 15 people off your court, and that will give us control. But my vulgar past tells me this, convener, you don't have to, they don't have to do that. They only have to get the principal of Edinburgh University into a room and say, we've got power under Section 8 to do that. And that, you, may, you may tell me, and I'm happy to be guided by that, never happens in the world of politics. But my experience of life is that power can be handled in a number of different ways. And it, the, 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 the theoretical power is there to do that, and it doesn't have to be exercised to have the effect that the section would, is intended to have. Uh, okay. Uh, um, <clears throat> okay, I won't comment at myself, but um, it's an interesting view, David. Um, Emily. Come back to George's point about uh, universities representing their, their communities that they're, they're situated in. And I think it's worth coming back to, Tim mentioned earlier, the five institutions uh, in Scotland that are in the Times Higher Top 200. And it's worth noting that all five are the ancient universities where they do have this elected chair model and, and really showing how this, this model can allow institutions to flourish. And I think it's really worth noting that, that we are unconvinced for any pre-selection panels and we would push for open democracy for the chairs. And we think really that, uh, I think, short of what Professor Sharkey was saying, that, that students and staff would choose someone who is capable and knowledgeable and interested in, in the institution, uh, as they have done with the rectorial model for centuries. And I think it's, it's really clear to us that when this, this democratic system is in place, that our institutions are better placed to make good decisions for the people's best interests, and that's staff and students. It's not the bottom line. Our universities are not businesses. Thank you. Um, Mark. Thanks, Kavina. I think I'd say, firstly, in, I think support the general principles of the bill here, but I think, for me, the issue of ONS reclassification is is quickly becoming um, a key issue um, for me. What I'd like to ask um, members of the panel, given their fear around the, the financial implication um, of ONS reclassification, um, are any members of the panel um, comfortable that the legislation goes forward on the basis where we have a disparity between University of Scotland saying that reclassification is an amber to a red risk and Scottish government officials deeming reclassification to be a, a, low, less, a, ro a low risk. You know, what work needs to be done um, by the Scottish government um, to, to allay the fears of the sector of ONS reclassification? As I say, I think this is faster becoming the, the key issue in this legislation. I'm going to quickly round, run round here. Um, Jennifer. In terms of the risk... It the, the, the question is, do we believe that's a real risk? Yes. Do no, what, what can be, I think it was what can be done to allay that. Well, I, I, th I think in a pause in terms of clarifying what ONS um, would consider in terms of what independent autonomy looks like, how we preserve the right of universities to be able to raise funds, connect with business, accept philanthropic gifts and not become public bodies but retain their current status. And until we've got absolute clarity in those positions, then what we understand needs to drive forward good governance, transparency, modernisation, openness, we can do through the code. The code's due to be reviewed in a three-year review this next year. You know, we can work to look at what issues are still outstanding in terms of the code and current practice. We can present that very openly and transparently, and we continue to work on, on driving good governance through that code. I think ONS is a, a real risk to the sector in terms of investment and success in the, in the future. We do have to take into account financial accountability as governing bodies. We absolutely, our principals are accounting officers to the Scottish Funding Council. You know, we as chairs and boards are accountable in terms of financial sustainability of the organisations as a whole. ONS reclassification becoming public bodies has had a severe impact on the FE sector and it's not a risk we can afford to take with the HE sector. We're too successful, we're too important to the Scottish economy to put that risk. If the issue is around about governance, transparency and modernisation, can we address that through the review of the code? And can we take the ONS issue very, very seriously in terms of financial risk to the success of the future of the sector? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, David. I mean, the trouble, as I understand it, and I'm not an economist, the ONS will only decide when it's seen all the facts. This is why the problems are arising in a number of cases. What happens is they, they sit and wait until everything is clear, and then they say yes or no. There is no clearance procedure. You can talk to the Treasury. I don't know if the Scottish Government's talked to the Treasury. They certainly haven't told us they've talked to the Treasury. And you can get some informal guidance, but you, you won't get an answer. The ONS says, we'll look at it when it's settled. And that's the real... Apart from the risks of it happening, the, the bigger risk is no one's going to know whether it will happen or not. Okay. Jeffrey? I agree with my colleagues uh, about the ONS, and they are more expert than I am. But I recently came from an American university, Johns Hopkins, because Robin uh, mentioned that. I have to say that this is a much more enlightened country. There were no uh, staff or students that were formerly part of the Hopkins board. In fact, it was more increasingly hedge fund managers to help them raise the $4 billion that they wanted to raise for their campaign. So there's already, I celebrate the greater transparency here, and I would encourage us uh, to do this through the code and the, and the mechanisms that are in place already. Thank you. Uh, Anne-Marie, did you want to... I, I just thought there was a couple of Mary's concerns uh, relating to staffing issues and ensuring the staff voice is heard. All of our universities across the UK, and especially here in Scotland, have a very good mechanism, which is the Joint Negotiating Committee, which is management, sure, with uh, the recognised trade unions in every uh, university. There is an opportunity, I think, to give greater transparency around the work of that and the issues that are emerging there. We've done some of that, but at a higher level in the university, I think. Uh, these are fantastic mechanisms. Sure, there will be crises of governance from time to time because universities and organisations are run by people and therefore there will always be conflict. When conflict arises, governance can be a mechanism if you have appropriate structures in place by which issues are raised earlier and brought to the attention of the governing body if need be. So I think um, there are further improvements we can make, even out with the code, uh, that would enhance governance further. Okay, thank you. Mary, do you want to come back on that? Um, yeah, and I know it's a, a later question, but maybe I'll raise this point now. I, I would really urge the committee to look at the Scottish Government's Working Together Review, which was a review from 2014 uh, set up between the Scottish Government and the Scottish TUC. It had an independent chair, Jim May, that it had three employers and three uh, trade union nominees and an academic advisor and that review um, looked at the relationship in the workplace it looked at how trade unions employers interact and it made a really important recommendation recommendation 24 uh, which recommends that all public sector boards should have um, a workplace um, by a trade union nominee on their board um, which you know as I see it this is the uh, higher education sector uh, coming into line with that important recommendation which was set out by um, the Working Together and Independent uh, Review um, in 2014. Um, I was also going to quickly answer uh, Mark Griffin's point, because, um, which was about the ONS and how do we move this forward. Uh, you know, and I think we, you know, we iron out any of the drafting issues that are in the bill, uh, but then uh, we, the sector, get round the table and work out the mechanism for an elected chair so that we don't have in the bill Scottish ministers will do X, Y, Z. You know, it will say in the bill and it will uh, give back, uh, well, it will set out a structure and a framework for how we get an elected chair which the sector can um, uh, agree to. Thank you. I, I want to, I want just, I, I'm going to move, come on to the, the, the sort of trade union reps and elected chairs directly. We'll, we'll deal with that in one second, but I've got Liz and Liam who wanted in, so briefly. Uh, twice this morning you've uh, mentioned that there have been bad decisions made. I wonder, could you give us examples of these bad decisions that have in any way undermined the educational uh, experience of our students, held back their institution and therefore held us back in our international standings? I am very hesitant here to focus on individual de decisions in individual in institutions. Let me give you a category of decision which has happened a number of times, which is that a university would decide that its fundamental position, its fundamental purpose, would rapidly change, would substantially change from being one kind of university. I'm trying not to name a university here. Um, no, I'm just interested, that, I mean... But uh, what, the, you, what you can... This, this, excuse me just one minute. The, this bill... It is obviously trying to address uh, concerns in the governance arrangements. Okay, that's the intention of the bill. 
And <clears throat> what I'm interested in, if we're going to take this forward, is what, what, what is the evidence that the current system of governance has got specific problems? Now, you said this morning twice that there are bad decisions being made. What I'd like to know is what these bad decisions are in terms of, uh, in some way, undermining the student experience in their education, how they've held back their institutions, and how they've held us back in our international reputation. If you're an art student at Strathclyde University, a big and very radical decision about the future of that university was made in an extremely short turnaround time. We will not know for a generation or two whether that was the right decision. Universities are generational institutions. It happened too fast and it happened without discussion. I don't even know it was the wrong decision. I'm saying that this is the kind of decision that can come uh, a major decision that can be made by the university sector, which, and this is the difficulty, universities don't, um, their, their reputations, their positions don't change overnight. It can be many years later before you find that actually moving away from a broad-based model to a narrow-based model in an individual institution of its subject provision harms that university. I'm also going to say that there is no question there is a lack of trust uh, among the public on um, leadership salaries. It's a trust issue as well. But this is another key point here. Governance is not just a watchdog role. And that's what I think has been a little bit of a difficulty with this accountability. Good governance drives good thinking. It's not just about preventing bad decisions. It's about creating, if I could call it a gene pool, of people who can inject positive thinking into a university. So it's not just a deficit model. Good governance brings new ideas, new perspectives, mm -hmm. and new talent into an organisation. And that's a key part of what we should be looking but at. But has that been held back, Mr McCall? Because I look at these league uh, tables and you know, an, an ordinary member of the public would wonder what on earth we're doing because it looks as though the Scottish universities are doing exceptionally well. An ordinary member of the public would wonder why one democratically elected member of a university board is such a, is such a problem. I think you should be careful here to suggest that the sense that universities are seen as in, in society are seen as organizations which are rather out of democratic um, control and how these decisions are made is as equal you're, you're sitting here as a group of managers who represent the, the leadership of the universities and um, you've got staff and you've got students who are saying well, we don't think that this is working for us but and would, that would, has got to be listened to. Would, well. would, you, would you agree? Liz, Liz, sorry. So, no, I'm sorry. I, mean, I, did, I, said, I said briefly, and I've got other members who have to come in. And with the time, we've still got some subjects we, have to, we do have to cover. So I'm going to have to interrupt. I do apologise. Liam, if you've got a brief It was only, and David Ross picked up the, the, the point up. I mean, Oscar will helpfully give us guidance. ONS will not. And, and I think that's the quandary we're in on, on, on the ONS reclassification. Oh, oh, th thanks for that brief comment. I, I want to. Uh, I, I apologise for interrupting, but I, I think it's important that we, given the time, that we, we tackled head on the, the issue of, which I think we, we just begun to get into a little bit there, of the issue of trade union reps uh, being on the boards and, of course, the direct question of elected chairs, which we've kind of skirted round a little bit. And I think that's one of the que these are questions which have certainly, in what I've seen, it, it are some of the most um, difficult bits to, to come to an agreement on. So I want us to go, to go round on, on this particular issue. We've had evidence sent to us by... Uh, the university sector, for example, who have raised objections to the, the proposal of trade union reps, saying that they would um, they would effectively represent a sectoral interest. Um, but and I, and I want to read from the Scottish government's policy memorandum, where it says trade union representatives would be required to act in the best interests of the HEI, as opposed to any individual constituency which nominated them. So, in other words, they would they, although they would come from that sector, they would have to operate in the best interests of the institution. Is there anybody who has got, uh, or can explain to me what the problem is with trade union representatives, for example, and others, being, being involved in the way that's been suggested through the bill? David. Can I first of all say that on our court, we have the immediate past president of UCU, and his predecessor was a previous senior official of UCU. But the point from us, from our perspective, mm -hmm. convener, is this one size fits all. They are directly elected by all the staff. The union runs the election, anyone can stand and anyone can vote. And to my mind, that's one of the unintended consequences of this bill. That is a system which seems to me takes away the issue of conflicts of interest because the constituency is the, is the, whole, is the whole staff. 
And it seems to me that that is a neat way of, of ensuring representation of employee representatives uh, as opposed to the nominated approach, which does seem somewhat less democratic. So it does seem to me the issue here, I, I, I'm happy to say publicly that Dave Anderson is a very valued member of our court, as was his, his predecessor. The, I don't think any of us have a, an issue about trade union members being on the governing body, but it's hugely important that they're clearly there in a, in a, in a, in a, in a representative say, for, the, for the whole staff, not simply for a, a narrower interest, which can therefore lead to the accusation or the concern that you'll have a conflict of interest. Okay, uh, Anne-Marie. Franchise in our institution a large proportion of our community um, because we have on our court uh, three staff uh, members, two of whom must be academic and one must be uh, professional service staff. Of course, we are a highly international university. Those elections for those posts are open to all of our colleagues across the world, including our campuses in Dubai and Malaysia. Trade unions are not permitted in Dubai, and therefore the current process of somebody coming forward and being elected by the entire body means that they're representing the views of all of our uh, students and staff, or s uh, staff across the uh, world. And I think that's a very important point uh, because uh, a large percentage, as I say, will be disenfranchised if that... Okay. Um, um, of course, Mary looked rather... As if she wanted to come in on that, so Mary Senior. Um, yeah, I, I guess Anne-Marie's raised another important issue around governance and the fact that we've got um, campuses in places where human rights um, are barely there and trade unions are not recognised. And I, I don't think that's a good reason not to have trade union nominees on elected bodies. I think it does raise the issue of, you know, how do we scrutinise decisions to open campuses um, in faraway places that have a very poor track record on human rights. Um, I also wanted to make the point, um, just to say, David, the union doesn't run the election for, uh, the, for the staff seats on the University Court of Glasgow. Certainly the union does put forward nominations to that seat, um, and in the past couple of years we have been successful in getting the trade union candidate elected, but that doesn't always happen. Um, and I think, I mean, initially trade union... Sorry. It's the point about this is a democratic choice in terms of the staff have the democratic right to elect from their own body. The, the bill actually provides for staff nominees and trade union um, nominees. And, you know, I think we're actually quite offended that um, University of Scotland seem to have been suggesting that trade unions and trade union representatives can't actually adhere to Nolan principles. You know, we can. Just because um, students, staff and trade unions have a stake in the organisation doesn't mean they're not interested in the success of that organisation. You know, actually, if you read the Working Together review, you'll see how it indicates that trade unions bring a very authentic and genuine perspective um, you know, from the coalface, from actually what works, what doesn't. Their experience and their expertise is invaluable. Um, indeed, you know, trade unions are democratic organisations. You know, our members and our representatives are elected to those posts that they um, take forward um, in institutions. So, so to say there's a democratic deficit you know, really um, doesn't sit well with us. And I think trade unions, um, as the working together the review recognises, um, get the support, get training, uh, get the advice and get guidance in terms of taking forward um, their duties um, on uh, the boards of, of institutions or, or indeed public bodies. Um, you know, so I think this is a very uh, good, it's a very progressive um, report, a very progressive uh, recommendation and, and is in stark contrast from the attack on trade unions that we're seeing from um, the Westminster government in terms of the, the trade union bill. Um, so, you know, I think it's very important and I would really urge the committee to strongly support this recommendation. Does anybody else want to make any comment on the trade union reps question? OK, I'm going to move on to the, the, the second one I raised there, which was the elected chairs, which is obviously a point of disagreement um, around this table and in the sector. Um, clearly, there's, uh, the intention is to have elected chairs. Um, there has been a number of comments in the public press and in the evidence we've received about it. And... Um, and in particular around the, uh, the possible effect on rectors. Um, and I just wanted um, your opinions about that particular part of the bill, because clearly it's, it's an important part of the bill and many people have very strong views about it. Does anybody want to kick us off on that particular question? 
Sorry, Emily. Yes, I think uh, from our opinion, whether you call them rectors or you call them elected chairs, it is the same principle, and I think it's one that we shouldn't allow just to be in our ancient institutions, but rather across all of our institutions in Scotland. And it's one where... Actually, the position uh, is, is very uh, worthwhile and very reflective of the principles that it seems that we can all agree on, that we want more uh, democracy and we want our, our institutions and the governing bodies to reflect the communities and the main stakeholders that they have. Um, and I, I'm, I'm uncertain as to where the hesitancies come from because we've seen this great Scottish tradition uh, exist for centuries and function very well, and I'm sure Tim would as an institution that has a rector would agree to that and certainly uh, the rectors that I've spoken to Steve Morrison from Edinburgh Maggie Chapman from Aberdeen and Catherine Styler from St Andrews are all very supportive of the fact that elected chairs and the same principle of rectors would be uh, drawn out to all institutions rather than just the ancients okay. uh, David Yes. First of all, Callan, on behalf of the students of Glasgow University who are not members of NUS, I know they are deeply concerned at the continuing lack of clarity over what's intended for rectors. And I think that is a legitimate concern. They certainly valuable. They value greatly the, the, the fact that there is someone elected to the governing body whose sole role is to represent students. And I think it is important, convener, just to the avoidance of doubt, to make clear that what the way rectors operate at the minute, and there actually are four varieties in Scotland, with, with six universities with rectors, um, is not what the bill is proposing. Each one of these institutions has someone like me, perhaps much better than me, but I'm the convener of the court at the University of Glasgow. In Edinburgh, you're the vice convener. In St Andrews, you're the senior governor. And I think in Aberdeen, there is someone like me who is the line manager of the principal and who is responsible for carrying out the duties. That is what the bill wants to elect. And I, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but there is a serious risk here, convener, that what this will do is weaken the governing body and strengthen management, which is exactly what is, with all due respect, in this city, we've seen some fairly spectacular circumstances where the senior management in the, the financial sector are not subject to proper control. If, if, I, if, I am not, if I'm elected by an outside body, I will have conflicting loyalties. I will have loyalties to staff and to the students. At the minute, as Jennifer said, I've got a job to do. I'm appointed by the court. If they don't like, they can get rid of me. But when I go and talk to Professor Moscatelli, who I'm sure you know and is a very polite man, he listens to me because I'm speaking for the court because they wanted me to do so. And if that doesn't happen, you will weaken the governing body, you will strengthen the management, and that's bad for governments. Tim. Um, and the 1858 Act established the Senate at the University of Edinburgh. It is in, it, it, in its current, more or less its current form, it established a rector. Over the more than 150 years, we have refined both of those models. Our Senate is now more democratic and inclusive, and this bill would damage that. We have a very particular dual model, which is extremely successful, where we have a presiding rector elected by all the staff and students, and forms a very key ombudsperson function, a very key leadership function at the big meetings of the court. And we have a working vice convener uh, who has, gives us the accountability uh, which is high, absolutely necessary for an organisation um, that has got expenditure of more than 800 million a year. You need, you need both the democracy and the accountability. At the moment, we have got a system which, as Emily kindly mentioned, you know, is very well regarded. It's very well regarded by the students and staff, but very well regarded by the different bodies that fund us. Uh, and we find it extremely unhelpful that there should be a bill proposing a simplification which will either damage the democratic aspect of how we lead our court or it'll damage the accountability or it might damage both I think you know I do plead with this committee we have got good systems in Scotland we can refine them we are refining through the code of governance please pause on this legislation because simple changes uh, when you've got 19 HEIs as diverse as this will inevitably result in damage and the bill as drafted would damage the democratic nature of the University of Edinburgh Senate and it would damage the combination of democracy and accountability we have in our court. Jeffrey. On our side, uh, we believe we have a highly functioning representative democracy. So our students and staff that are elected by the staff and student bodies would participate 
very clearly in any uh, search for a new chair, as they did in the search for me. Um, I had a, a really detailed grilling from the head of the student union, who'd also arranged for me to meet with the, the student body as a whole. But it wasn't subject to an open election, and that very open election with an as yet undefined electorate could keep some of the finest candidates that we're seeking to get. We want to, you know, beat the National Theatre of Scotland or the RSNO for the kind of chair that can really advance the arts for Scotland. They may seek not to apply. Uh, and that, that, is a, that is our worry, that it becomes too competitive and, and too open and exposed, rather than the representative democracy that we have at the moment. We have a right to decide. In consultation, we have a right to voice an opinion. And I think this is important. And I think it was a quite, and I know it's unfair to pick up points that people said, but I don't think you should see the interests of staff and students as a conflict of interest in the running of a university. I think you should see them as being at the very heart of a running of a university. And the, the, the university is not a private institution completely devoid of its community. And this is one of the things which I think is just a, a conceptual thing. With most organisations, you can identify, inverted commas, an owner, a group on whom this institution is run on behalf of. And one of the difficulties is, as universities over the last 30, 40 years have moved away in many cases, not all, and there's variations, from a more collegiate model to more, a more executive run model, what you're doing, in my opinion, is it seems to me there has been a division of those who represent the ownership of that university, its wider community, and their ability to decide and to shape the university. Now, I would go further. I'd love to see us move towards democratic universities, which are communities which decide collectively. And I think this is going to be the future for an awful lot of uh, organisations in the public realm. This is an era where people expect to be able to be treated as capable, as members of a community, of shaping that community. And I think, as a first step, to be able to see that there is a, a, an election, and I, I really worry about this idea that you know better than everybody else who's a good person to run a university. This is, that, that's exactly the sort of financial sector service model that caused problems. Um, I think it's dangerous to say that a small group of people and they alone can decide who's good. And yes, there are people who might be put off, potentially, but I think there's probably many thousands of people, potentially, who could do a phenomenally good job, a really inspirational job in an institution who are out there and who may not be selected by your committee. And yet they might be able to get the support because of a vision that they have or because of uh, a real sense of what they want to do in that institution who can come forward and can get the support to inspire support from staff and students to put them in that place. And I think for every one person you might lose of people who do not want to be in a democratic election, I suspect there must be hundreds of others who could do a wonderful job for your institution who will never be considered. And this is one of the problems of mistaking stakeholder consultation for democracy. There must be, if you don't have roots in for people, then you greatly close off your pool. And, and that's one of the difficulties. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Emily. Yes, I wanted to pick up on, Robin mentioned it as well, but asked David directly, you said if you, were, if you had been elected, you would have conflicting uh, views if you were elected by staff and students as opposed to the court. Can you point out exactly where they'd be, please? I should maybe paint the background, which I suspect that my court has got the widest section of representation of staff and students in, 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 in Scotland. Um, the difficulty is this. My responsibility as convener of the court is to the court. It is not to the people, I'm not responsible to those who elected me. If you have a, an elector, and we have, you know, I think, convenient with all due respect, those of us at the ancient universities who see rectorial elections on a regular basis and enjoy them hugely understand the, the, the environment in which that takes place. I, the point I was making was that I have only one loyalty, and that is the people who told me, and one responsibility, to the people who appointed me to do what I'm doing. And they hold me to account, and they can get rid of me. If I am brought in by, if I am elected in some other way, there isn't that connection. The governing body is weakened, because you have a divided governing body in which the chair has responsibilities to a range of stakeholders, hugely important stakeholders, and the governing body doesn't have the chair that it wants to appoint. So that's, the, it, it, weakened, weakened governing bodies are legendary for their inability to handle, deal to produce good governance. And that's my concern. Yeah. I'm sure as a sector we could come to a conclusion of how that mechanism of accountability would work, surely. Uh, and on that point, 
Um, I, I am going to have to draw this to a close, unfortunately. I, I know there's a lot of stuff that um, we want to discuss, but given the time, and we have another panel um, yet to um, uh, see, so I, I apologise for that, but I am going to have to draw it to a conclusion. What I would say, though, we have a lot of written evidence. Um, we had a lot of written evidence already submitted to the committee. I'm sure if there's anything that you wish to add to your views you've expressed around the table today, please send it to me, uh, and I'm sure that the committee would be delighted to receive it. Um, can I thank all of you for giving your time to come along this morning, and can I suspend briefly?
Uh, we'll now take evidence uh, on the bill from the Scottish Government officials. And can I welcome to committee this morning uh, Laura Duffy, Stephen White and Ilsa Heine. Um, we're going to go straight into questions, if you don't mind, um, and I'm going to start with uh, George Adam. Um, the first question would be about governance and autonomy of the institutions themselves. You know, there's been much uh, talk about uh, during the previous uh, section about how we should go forward. Uh, what, how does the Scottish Government feel with regards to how sufficiently modern, inclusive or accountable that uh, the universities currently are? Could you possibly start off with that then? I think it would be fair to say that the Scottish Government are very appreciative of Scotland's excellent universities. Um, they're aware that governance um, has been improved by the Code following the uh, review of higher education governance in Scotland led by Professor Von Prindinsky. But I think it would be fair to say, I'm not a minister, but it would be fair for me to say that they feel there is room for improvement, greater inclusivity and transparency in arrangements so that every voice on campus uh, can be heard equally. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say every voice, uh, in general, there's, there's no actual kind of uh, process put in place so we can see how it would, how it would work. What, what are the thinkings that currently with regards to governance? Do you mean elected chairs specifically? Yeah, well, in general, well, yeah. The actual constituency, how would, they, how would it work out? The, the franchise of election mm. for an elected chair, is that what you... Yep. Yeah. Um, well, perhaps uh, if I can answer that question by giving a, a brief explanation of why Section 1 of the Bill reads as it does. Um, when the consultation was launched late 2014, early 2015, uh, the government set out plans clearly to have um, chairs elected after a selection process, which would be to... Uh, discern that the, the candidates could actually fulfil the role. Um, and that discussion uh, threw up quite a lot of different comment, and uh, the, I think from you know lots of people in the university sector were opposed to the proposal, which the previous session would have revealed. But of those groups who were um, positive about the bill, they didn't agree in the format or the franchise. So that was what led introduction to the Section 1 coverage being around a power for ministers. But as soon as that was introduced, a dialogue started with all stakeholders in the sector to talk about franchise specifically, and that is ongoing. And I think the Cabinet Secretary said in the letter that the committee received that, that she'd be minded to consider a stage two amendment based on that dialogue to have a single model provided for in the bill. Okay. That's, 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 I hope that answers your question, because that's exactly what the situation is at the moment in practical terms. Yeah, no, that's fine, thanks. Fine. Okay. Yeah. So, did you want to come in, Chick? Well, I'll come back to you then, Liz Smith. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, could I could I draw your attention to uh, the discussions that took place at the Finance Committee um, two weeks ago? Um, could I ask you what advice did you take uh, regarding the uh, possible reclassification of universities? Well, I would. Personally, I was at Finance Committee, so I'll, I'll, I'm happy to answer questions. If I paraphrase the ones I gave before, which are on the record, um, I think if you mean by advice external to the Scottish Government specifically, uh -huh. Uh -huh. yes. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, didn't take advice specifically from out with uh, the Scottish Government. It was a summation of advice across government colleagues in different departments. And I think that's, you know, it's not the exact words I used, but that's what I said at committee two weeks ago. Could, could I ask why you didn't uh, take uh, advice external to the Scottish Government, particularly legal advice? Well, in the consideration of the, the Eurostar, the European System of Accounts Guidance and Indicators of Control, we felt the internal analysis was sufficient. But specifically on the way that ONS work, and I, I don't have my colleague Kerry, who's a finance colleague, who was at committee that day. The ONS is it's not the sort of organisation you engage with and work through the detail. And I think um, David indicated that they will look at things at the end. So looking at your, your early plans wouldn't be a conventional way to engage with them. Um, other organisations, uh, I, I, I would repeat what I said, that the, the internal analysis of the indicators of control threw up the conclusion that there was compliance in the Bill's provisions with those indicators of control and that risk was not advanced by this Bill. Uh, so in that case, uh, and given that obviously ONS will not uh, give a ruling until all the facts are on the table, um, how do you respond to the comments from University Scotland uh, who do have uh, legal advice and who've published that legal advice that there is significant risk. Yeah, they were kind enough to share it with us, so we're, we're, it's quite new, so we, we will consider that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's not for me to, as a person, uh, you know, as one person to respect that opinion, but we do, and it's part of the bill process and the consideration. Um, 
the government, and as uh, summarised in, in Ms Constance's letter that went to the Finance Committee, and I believe has been shared with, uh, with this committee as well, uh, take a slightly different view on the, on the quantum of risk and consider that the, this bill does not advance any, any, uh, any risk, um, above any risk that existed before. And I think the Finance Committee heard quite a detailed passage of the discussion on that um, but, but during its session. Mr White, I, I hope you can understand that you know, there is a very serious concern here as the possible uh, amount of mon money that could be to the detriment of the sector uh, if indeed ONS uh, reclassification uh, did have that impact. Um, and in the uh, response that Angela Constance has given uh, yesterday, uh, she hasn't actually addressed these uh, concerns. Uh, is it not, given just how significant this potentially could be, uh, would you agree that it's a bit odd that the, that the uh, Scottish Government hasn't actually spelt out and gone into detail with some outside advice as to exactly uh, what numbers we might be talking about? Um, I mean, there's absolutely no, no question that the comments from University of Scotland would be taken lightly. They're taken extremely seriously. I mean, we have a very close relationship with University of Scotland in a number of policy areas in higher education, so, so, so that's a given. Um, I, I mean, I gave an answer to Mr Baker in the other committee, and, and a, a, probably a similar one I, I would offer, that the fact that the Scottish Government haven't analysed potential numbers is that our assessment is that, that the, the, num the, the risk in numbers would be theoretical because the risk itself is not, is not substantial. So I suppose that the, the idea that we, go th we, we would do a detailed analysis of numbers um, if we don't think the risk is, is substantial, but, be a, a sorry, how, how, do you, how do you make that conclusion that the risk is probably not substantial? The, the, what, how are you coming to that the conclusion? The basis of that analysis was a consideration of all of the indicators of control contained in the European System of Accounts Guidance, which the ONS used to make their determinations. Now, that, that's a risk analysis. It's not an empirical science. It's a risk analysis. But it's, it's not a binary thing, yes or no answers. It's, a, it's, an, it's our assessment of, of With of one risk. billion pounds at stake? I think it's more than, uh, you know, it's a very serious uh, concern that uh, the, the amount uh, of discussion about these possible effects, it, you would expect in a bill like this, which has a, a huge implications for one sector, a very successful educational sector, uh, and it looks as though the Scottish Government hasn't done its homework very well. That's for ministers to consider your comments. Uh, oh, Liam MacArthur. Yeah, in terms of the risk analysis that you've undertaken, does that factor in ministerial intent or does it actually solely look at the scope of the provisions that have been put in this bill because we've had reassurances from from the cabinet secretary as Liz Smith indicated which would tend to suggest there's a recognition of a potential risk there but actually whatever reassurances an individual minister gives um, that is unrelated to the scope of the provisions that we're being asked to um, consider in, uh, within the context of this bill. I, th I think that again some material that the, the Finance Committee raised that there is certainly an open mind um, and ministers are looking at all the evidence written and oral about how modification of certain of the regulation making powers might address that risk. I think I'm right in saying that Professor Muscatelli indicated in his evidence, his oral evidence to, to that committee, that uh, an examination of those sections to pare back, not, not his words, my own, um, any um, feature which might suggest that there was a heightening of risk would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Mark? Thanks, Mayor. Just on the, the ONS reclassification um, from the Finance Committee, um, the Scottish Government have said that we deem reclassification to be a low risk, and University of Scotland have said that reclassification was an amber to red risk. Could you explain your opinion as to why there's um, that difference of opinion as to the level of risk? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, a very, it's obviously an extremely serious issue, so it's, it's, it's certainly not about my opinion, it's about an opinion of, of, the, of the government. Um, I think that our assessment, the Scottish Government's assessment, was squarely focused on the indicators of control that are used by the Office of National Statistics to make their determinations. And if you go through them, I think not to um, you know, paraphrase a very detailed document entirely, but there's a great emphasis there on direct control of appointments, people on, people off. Um, the bill is about processes, it's about the how, it's not the who. People are not placed on, uh, taken off through the provisions of this bill. It's about consistent, transparent, 
inclusive processes. So you've come to the, the government have come to the conclusion going through that process um, that the risk of reclassifications is a low risk. Do you, do you think the um, University of Scotland have gone through a different process to the one that you have described the, the government? No, no, through. absolutely not. Um, they've looked at all the same indicators of control. They might, they, in fact, they might even say that they've looked at them differently, more thoroughly. I don't know, but no, they've looked at exactly the same material. But a, a risk. I'm not. I'm not a risk manager. But risk is not an exact science. Um, people will see a heightened risk where others, others looking at the same material, will see a more modest risk. There's. Um, I, I don't want to put it in a nutshell for convenience, but there, there seem to have a different opinion, and it's simply the different opinion they hold. And that, has the Cabinet Secretary or government officials met with University of Scotland to discuss that difference of opinion to see um, what different emphasis perhaps they're putting on um, different <laughs> risks? Um, I mean, to, to answer your question very honestly and directly, that, I mean, we have lots of meetings with the University of Scotland and we've talked about elected chairs models as part of the dialogue that I indicated earlier, and the ONS question would come up. But if there's been a direct meeting with the only agenda item on that, I don't think there has been that, but it's, it's something that we talk about all the time. We exchange materials. The University of Scotland were kind enough to share the, the legal advice that they had, they had sourced with us very swiftly, and we appreciate sight of that. But the, the issue of ONS reclassification has been discussed between the government and University of Scotland. Well, it's certainly, but certainly between officials, yes. I, I, I couldn't remember right here and now if the Cabinet Secretary has met on it, but officials have discussed it, yes. Okay. Check, Brody. Okay, good morning. I wanted to ask you about the appointment of the chair of the government body, which, of course, is a, <coughs> a contentious issue. Uh, and I, I ask these questions, you know, partly as devil's advocate, but also as somebody who had been a lay member of the Court of St Andrews and also has chaired several organisations. The government has stated that it has no intention of politicising the office of elected chair or being involved in the appointment process. It is our intention that the franchise for the electoral process would not expand beyond the community within each HEI. It's a nonsense, isn't it? I mean, how can somebody lead a body? And I, as you have heard earlier, about the appointment of each member of the body being subject to a rigorous interview <laughs> and adoption process involving staff and students. How is someone going to be elected <coughs> as chair if their particular views run counter to uh, the court? Okay. Um, I suppose I would start by responding to that question by... Um, clarifying what the, where the evidence base is for, the, for that concept. That was in the review of higher education governance chaired by Professor Von Brandinsky. It was the recommendation on elected chairs which inspired the way the consultation item, the Scottish Government's consultation, was framed. Um, again, I wasn't on the Von Brandinsky review myself, but I think from reading it in, in recent days to prepare for today, that there was... Uh, 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 an idea that the selection element was required in order that the person who took up the role could, could perform the duties. The selection by whom? By, um, well, by a, a, a representative cross-section of uh, people within the university to come together to decide that. What cross-section? Well, uh, academic staff, lay members, well, sure, students. They should staff. all, if that's the case, there should be no priority. They should all do it, or none should do it. Well, I think that in practical terms, they often have uh, committees put together to source uh, a chair. So it would just be make sure that that committee, which would be a smaller unit of the overall court, would be representative. I'm still unsure as to how, in my experience, the chair in private companies or in organisations or association has to carry a, or at least ameliorate some of the the, 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 the wider decisions of the, of the body that they represent. It's a very difficult position. And the wider selection by a cross section would make, I would suggest, makes that job more difficult in, if they cannot carry the majority of the body with them. An election process, although the government says it has no intention of politicising the office, that's exactly what happens, isn't it? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I've answered your question because I'm not sure I understood the initial one correctly. I mean, maybe if I explain the process and then you can, you can home in on the bit that's most helpful. 
The von Prindinsky review, uh, in summary, suggested that there be a selection element and then an election element. The franchise of that election <coughs> element was actually writ quite broadly. There was even a suggestion that maybe out with the university community, people in the local community, I don't know, local authority representatives, I'm unsure. But what the government clarified in the consultation was that the franchise, who would get to vote for the chair, would not be out with the university community. So to, put, to paint a practicality around that, <coughs> options might include the governing body itself. Others may disagree with that and say, well, it should be all staff and students. Uh, so that would be the electorate. That would be the, you know, two examples of potential electorates who would vote after a selection period. So the selection period was felt to be important by a cross-sector panel. Without that, I, I suppose it opens up to risk that candidates who may not be able to carry out the duties would find themselves in that place. I don't know if that answers your, your question. I'm happy to expand on it if it doesn't. Yeah, I, I, I think I understand. <clears throat> it, doesn't, it doesn't really answer the practicalities of those that, those that have been there how difficult that particular role is. And in this election, where, is the, where does the general, the wider public interest and public investment, investor uh, uh, involvement lie? Well, I, I mean, I think that the universe, the, 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 this is a sort of virgin territory in the sense that the bill doesn't, doesn't actually make any provision for that. But um, universities have many ways to communicate with the public beyond that. I mean, what, what I think we are concerned with here is that the internal governance, there's, there's an element of reform in that. Universities provide the annual reports, their business plans and so on. The bill doesn't want to prescribe how universities communicate with the outside world or, or communicate their successes. It's about the internal organisation of the, of, well, of forgive the institution. Me, forgive me. A chair of, uh, of, a, uh, of a body, a governing body of a un major university with international experience. You're telling me that all they're going to do is internalise and not represent the governing body in the university yeah. uh, to that. No, uh, no, no, of course not. Uh, to be honest with you, I've just got to I'll be honest, I'm not sure I fully understand your initial question and I'm trying my best to answer it. I would expect the chair of any university to be uh, an ambassador, a great exponent of its values, both internally, externally, help it to thrive and succeed. I, and, and hopefully candidates would come forward who um, may accept the prudence of selection and then be delighted to be elected by whatever franchise that the, the legislation provides for. As I say, but, but I say, I maybe have to make a partial apology that I've not understood the initial question. Just last question. It, it suggests there might be an amendment in stage two uh, that would replace section one. Can you give us any advice what that might be? Well, as I said to, to, to the other member, um, that, that's still an active discussion with all stakeholders, universities, other higher education institutions, unions, students. And what that would be, it would map out instead of the regulation making power, would be the, uh, the structure of this selection and then election. It would also comment on the franchise. And section 1 itself um, provides um, illustrative elements of what could have been in regulations. So some of them may or may not appear, but mainly it would be the absolute staples of how selection would work what the franchise would be for the election. They would be the staples that would be in an amendment. Um, the aim is to have as much of a consensual model as possible provided for. That's why the discussions are constant and they've been very active since June. And, and indeed before that, inspired by the consultation. We just, the consensus. The consensus The, the between consensus would best be arrived at by choosing, would it not, the chairman or chairwoman uh, from the, the body that they actually chair? So you, you, you're supporting a franchise of the governing I'm body? Sorry, no, I'm playing devil's advocate. I want to hear what your views are in terms of... Yeah. Well, I mean, the, well, the, the government want to facilitate as consensual a model as possible. They would rather everyone agreed on the model than, than simply stipulate a model. But obviously there's, a, there's an end, you, know, you can't ex exhaust dialogue forever. I think it's incumbent on partners to talk to government to, to, to reach a consensus position. Okay, thank you very much. Liam? Yes. Um, I'm intrigued. I mean, there's an agreement that our, our universities are genuinely world class, I think, in response to George Adams' initial um, question. I think you accepted that. Um, I think we would all accept that that's not a reason to rest on the, law, on the laurels. Um, and there, there, may be, there may well be improvements that we, we need to be seeking to make through governance, whether through legislation or by, by other means. Whether through von Prinsinski's report or the work the Scottish Government's done, can you point to 
the international comparators in terms of governments that have informed the decisions um, uh, in terms of the drafting of this bill? I mean, what is the what, what is the nirvana we're trying to reach here in terms of uh, of good university governance that will safeguard and enhance the, the, the reputation and performance of universities internationally? Um, that's a very good question. I, I can't offer much, by the way, of the international um, perspective. Um, the von Brandinsky review was, I think it's fair to say, the inspiration for the consultation which has led to this bill. I know that the von Brandinsky review took a lot of evidence. Um, how much of that was international? Although I, I, I do seem to remember there was an element. I mean, perhaps there colleagues will. There is evidence taken Laura. from Scotland across the UK. Sorry, there is evidence taken from Scotland uh, across the UK, Europe, and America, as I understand, for the Brandinsky review. Right. But to answer the, the question that, that, led, that led from that, in terms of the, the Nirvana, I think was I think was the term term you use. Um, I, I don't think that the plan is to emulate any a, a, a per perfect model. I think that the ambition is to move on with, um, although there be others would disagree, a, a modest set of proposals to improve the transparency, inclusivity and modernity, I suppose, of governance and not to really be inspired by a bar that's been spotted anywhere else. But I mean, I, presumably the, the international comparators, because in terms of the, the, the the sector itself, it would see that its benchmarks aren't necessarily the rest of Scotland or indeed the rest of the UK, but they are international. Um, if we are drawing on the experience of, of other universities, one, one would hope that the experience that we're drawing on is from universities that are performing um, better than, than those currently in, in Scotland are performing. I mean, I think it, I would have thought it'd be easier to identify those models um, in an international sense than appears to have oh. been uh, apparent to date, there's nothing in, in terms of the, the policy memorandum, there's, there's nothing in terms of the materials we've been presented through, through SPICE. Um, that there's no indication as to, to what it is that we're seeking to, to, to emulate here. Yeah. Well, I, I did, I mean, I, I'm reading the von Brandinsky review last night, I, I, I did notice that what they said, they, they, they took a great deal of evidence um, on board when they conducted the review, which was published in 2012. But what they found themselves was that there was quite a a low level of actually research that had been conducted in higher education governance issues, which the way that the, the, the report was written seemed to me to suggest they were a bit surprised by that. So I, I, I'm, it's not a direct answer to the international question, but I don't think there is a great deal of reflection and evidence, a huge evidence base relative terms about higher education governance. Um, I, I, there has not been, there been a great deal of consideration of the international picture in assembling the bill, I, I could say that. Mary Scanlon. Thank you. I was interested to hear about the government's consensual model, and I would really like to congratulate you on uh, the consensus because I've never heard every single higher education institution in Scotland being so consensual in their agreement in opposition to this bill. Uh, and I mean, why you're going on a collision course at this point in time, uh, I do not know. So, can I just ask you, um, in terms of governance, um, uh, what did Oscar say when you discussed your approach to the forthcoming regulations within and further education to this bill? What was Oscar's response um, when you discussed this with them? I have not taken forward any discussion. You have not Oscar. discussed well, it well, with I'll, Oscar. Could I finish the, the answering the question, though? You asked me specifically if I understand the question that have we discussed the use of regulation-making powers with Oscar? rather than the bill in general. Is that correct? In terms Have of you what discussed your proposed approach to regulations with Oscar? In all sections? Or in, in, in all sections and the powers that will be forthcoming that are in this bill, future powers? No, not with Oscar yet. You have I mean, not done well, that? Well, the, the bill's only at stage one. It's, it's only in an early part of its, con if, if its consideration. I mean, to have a substantial discussion about how subsequent secondary legislative powers might be used with Oscar now... Um, no, I, well, I think I might be the discussion. only one sitting around this table that was actually on the committee in this parliament that set up the Office of the Scottish Charities Regulator. And I do remember from 10 years ago, and people from all parties would remember, that anything that was anywhere near ministerial diktat or policy interference they were no longer a charity. And, but Oscar have given us, uh, they no longer had that status, Oscar have been cautious in their approach. So they were able to talk to us, although you unfortunately were unable to talk to them. Um, but should such regulations uh, be enacted when, uh, when the bill comes forward, we would have to consider 
whether taken together with existing regulations, plus when the ministers have wider power to make further regulations, they would have to consider the impact of these measures with respect to ministerial control. So there's a big uncertainty there. There is a huge uncertainty within that. And I am disappointed that you've not managed to find time. They found time to give us advice, yeah. but you haven't found time to discuss this well, bill with them. I'd like to be helpful for coming back on that. I'd like to be helpful yeah. too. Yeah. Well, I mean, well ultimately, I mean, I'm, I'm not a minister. I can talk about the official engagement I've had with them. We talked to them. Um, after the bill was introduced and uh, before evidence was submitted to committee, which I think was covered earlier. And I note the passage that you read. They, they, they reserved the right, and entirely correctly, Good. because they've only considered what's in the face of the bill, that they would have a, perhaps have to revisit their, their position depending on how these secondary legislative powers were used. It, it, it certainly is the case that we would have a dialogue with Oscar, um, the Scottish Government rather than we, um, the Scottish Government would have a dialogue with Oscar in using these secondary legislative powers. All I'm saying is that, I'm being honest, no, there's not been an early discussion yet, but there certainly would be a discussion. There wouldn't be any uh, taking forward of secondary powers without consulting an important stakeholder like Oscar. Uh, it would be a bit more than an important stakeholder, but we'll leave that one there. Um, can I look at Scottish Government power to make regulations, in particular Section 14 and 20, may make different provision for different purpose. Section 20, ministers by regulation make supplemental, incidental, consequential, transitional, transit, transitory or saving provision as they consider necessary or expedient in the future. Um, so the Scottish Government's letter to this committee um, said in general the powers for Scottish Minister are intended to future proof the content of the bill. Now I think you made the words you said the words minor adjustments. Can that not be done under the Scottish Funding Council Code of Governance, which is to be reviewed next year? If there's you know further amendments, further review, further changes, etc. It's barely over a year old, so why do we need legislation? Could this not, uh, you know, could this not be done next year in the Code of Governance? Uh, and perhaps you could uh, explain why, in consultations, uh, these provisions were only intended as future proofing. Okay, I'll try and answer the various elements. Okay. In terms of the secondary legislative powers, um, the government has noted the strong opinions shared by lots of colleagues in the sector about uh, those and what they, in their view, think that means for advancement of government control. Um, Everyone, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, the, the government have uh, no intention to have any direct control or influence on the functioning of institutions. The, the, the various powers, I mean, some of them um, are, are, are I mean, legal colleagues would maybe have, uh, be able to, to provide a view, but they're quite standard in terms of future-proofing legislation. Um, in fact, they were all intended that way. However, um, obviously there's been specific views in different sections, and I think it would be fair to say that the Cabinet Secretary is very open-minded about listening to all oral evidence and all written evidence about how modification of those sections might be helpful. On the SFC question, I, I listened, I was on the, the benches earlier as well. Um, I suppose theoretically, if um, the sector at large and the, 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 the authors of the code were happy to have elected chairs and trade union representatives and staff and student representatives all as staples of the code, then that would perhaps be um, a profitable dialogue about changing the code. But I wouldn't imagine, given the strong views they have against those government plans in the bill, that they would want them to be in the code. And in terms of the consultation, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm trying to be helpful, I, th I think you may be picking up that certain colleagues, and I know David Ross in the chair's submission said that these powers weren't consulted on in January and in, you know, in, in, in late 2014. Uh, the bill was, th th that was a policy consultation, and then the bill developed from that, and these secondary legislative powers came out of that preparation. And I would probably go back to the first point I made, that they were intended to future-proof the bill. There's no um, ulterior motive in these, but the strength of feeling and the comments are clear. So, as I say as well, the Cabinet Secretary 
is uh, open-minded about looking at those views and how they might uh, influence those provisions. So can I just finally, convener, say, um, I don't want to refer to paragraphs and take up time, we're <laughs> running uh, short enough of time, but if you look through this, it's constantly, may, the government may by regulation do this, may by regulation do that. I've circled it five times just on one page. They may by regulation do a huge amount, uh, a huge amount of things. Does the government now regret that they've gone a step too far in this collision course with our higher education institutions, do I pick up from what you're saying that they are minded to make significant amendments, perhaps pause, take stock, and maybe just take a step back and listen to what's being said? I could certainly uh, be quite confident that they're, they're open-minded about making amendments. But the, the, the earlier part of your point is not, not for an official to answer. Thank you. Liz, a brief question, if you don't mind. It's just as a matter of clarification. Uh, Mr White, uh, as I understand it, there, uh, there would be uh, scope <coughs> to change the constitutions of certain uh, universities, and therefore, by definition, that involves uh, government control. Is that correct? I think the Oscar submission um, treated this with in some detail, and they, they, are, they, purport, they proposed that, they, that there would be alteration to the ancient universities' constitutions. I think I'm right in saying that, but then they, they went a layer below that and said that the bill's provisions didn't jeopardise uh, that being the case, Sorry, the, my, the my, charitable... My, my point of clarification was to ask you as an official, mm -hmm. is it your understanding uh, that by definition... Uh, there would be changes made to the constitutions of certain universities and therefore yeah. the government could be seen to further its control. Is that correct? I think it probably would the chance for Ailsa to come in here, particularly yeah. in the first yeah, part of that question. I mean, the, the bill will set out the, the minimum requirements for, for certain aspects of these bodies, which will then form part of the constitution. But the government already has a role in, in, in approving um, uh, changes to higher education institutions through the existing legislation under either the 1992 Act but, or... But this would increase it? I don't think it's fair to say it increases it. It's, it, it's, um, it's, change, it's just adding a, the, if it's mi adding, the minimum it's increasing. requirements. Sorry, can I just clarify this point? Because my understanding, and I've got a bit of the Oscar written submission, I think, on this point, where it states that in terms of the older universities where part one would form part of their constitutions, our view is that when taken together, these provisions in the bill do not amount to the existence of ministerial control in a way that would cause the older universities to breach section 74B of the 2005 Act. Yeah, that, that's the part that, that, that sprung to mind when, yeah. when, when, when I was asked the question. It's so, not just the older ones, but mm -hmm. the different constitution. The point is that the ancient universities, my understanding is, they have a different constitution to the more modern yeah. ones. So I think what the convener is pointing out is where Oscar applies to the ancients, not to the more modern ones. Yeah. They, did, they didn't make any commentary on any constitutional alteration to the other We're looking at all 14. universities. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Gordon? Thanks very much, convener. I wanted to ask you about the uh, composition of governing bodies. Um, the, the Code of Good Governance... Um, says that it specifies uh, that lay members should make up a majority of the governing board and that governing bodies should not normally exceed 25 members. Now, given that um, this proposed legislation suggests that um, up to eight members um, are co-opted onto or elected onto the board coming from staff, students, trade unions and alumni, is there anything in the legislation that uh, provides or determines um, whether there is a minimum or a maximum governing body size. I'm not sure how the, the 25 was arrived at at the Code of Good Governance, but is there anything that, that limits the size of the, the governing body? The, well, I'll give an interpretation. The, the 25 was adopted by the, uh, the authors of the code, and then it was subsequently adopted, I'll use the word adopted as a legal term, by this, the Scottish Funding Council, and as part of the terms and conditions of grant that uh, institutions or fundable bodies were, were to abide by the terms in the code. So the 25 has that status. Um, I think that... Um, 
eight members, although I know that lots have written, some of the oral evidence has said, well, it would be difficult to manage that, to accommodate that, and then still keep the, the mm -hmm. lay majority. Um, it's, I, I, I think that um, in practice, uh, that was what the von Prindinsky review suggested, mm. so they must have thought about, although that, that's before the code, I should say, I mean, don't want to confuse matters, the code was published the year after yeah. that, so actually probably it, it, that, that comment's not relevant. But I do think that it could be accommodated, I mean, it's not an opinion I hold, it's an opinion in the summation of the, go the government opinion. Um, of course, as well, the, the 25 is something that could be changed, I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't present a case for changing it, but it could be changed. Mm -hmm. And um, the Scottish Funding Council would come to a decision about any change to the code because you know, they're not going to only endorse it once and it will never change because I believe there's a, re a review mm -hmm. next year. So I suppose I, I, I wouldn't have the audacity to start making suggestions personally for uh, uh, court sizes, but it's not an immovable thing. It could be changed to accommodate mm -hmm. slight adjustments to accommodate what the bill would provide for. But also, I should apologise for that error there. That, yeah, the, the code was published a year after the 2012 review, so they wouldn't have talked about it. And, and you know, m much of, of this bill is, is about um, diversity and, and changing the, the makeup of the governing body. Now, um, NUS Scotland, in, in their evidence, said and this is in relation to the existing code, on the issue of wider diversity, only 40% of institutions had set targets for increasing the wider equality and diversity of their governing bodies, and only 30% were issuing regular reports on progress on equality and diversity targets with regards to governing body membership. So is the legislation itself going to address those points? You know, we've got this... Um, code of good governance, which it would appear from the NUS um, evidence that many un many universities are failing to comply with that. Therefore, is there anything within the legislation that would address the point of diversity of governing bodies? Um, I think the intention of the governing body composition provisions are that a community will lead the institution where the inclusivity and the representative nature of that would have a percussive effect on the way the whole institution mm. runs. So the bill doesn't make specific commentary on, for example, gender. In fact, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think it can because it's not, mm. not within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. But it's that percussive effect which is the aim, that there's a, a, a representative, fair and inclusive profile leading the organisation and that the conversations that they generate will lead to... Um, consideration of these areas as a, as, a, as a mainstay of the business of the institution. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Thanks. Yeah. Carrying on from that, I'd just like to ask some questions about the composition of the academic board. The committee had written to the government to ask about um, the requirement of right, ensuring that at least 10% um, of the membership of academic boards were made up of students and we have that written answer, but I just asked over and above that um, if you could um, set out what ways you think, the, the tangible ways in which an increased student um, numbers on um, academic boards will improve the work um, of the, the board um, and the academic quality throughout higher education institutions. Um, I, I, I would hopefully not give too simplistic an answer, but I think that the presence of students... Um, can only enrich uh, that that conversation, which is I mean, it was an academic conversation. I mean, I don't I don't think I can catalogue tangible changes in the business of a, the way an academic board would run. I'm I'm not on one, and I never have been. But again, it's part of that percussive effect of a more representative conversation in in that in that forum. Okay, universities um, themselves have expressed concerns about. Um, the size of the academic boards. Um, have you any comments um, based on the, the evidence that we've been given um, from the University of St Andrews, um, from the University um, of Aberdeen, who have um, St Andrews have talked about uh, a disbanding of their academic council to be replaced by a, a reform senate. Um, the University of Aberdeen flagging up issues about how they fear the loss of really crucial input from ex-official members. How does the government address the concerns of the sector um, 
over the size of the academic boards? Yes, I mean, uh, uh, th these comments have been, have been noted, and I think that we take them into consideration at this stage in the Bill's progress. I mean, the 120 figure comes from, simply comes from the view of higher education governance in Scotland. Now, it wouldn't have been arrived at Willie and Ellie. I would imagine it would have been subject to uh, lots of dialogue, which was cross-sectoral, and many opinions were taken. I mean, I, I, I imagine many Senates are probably less than 120 or, or academic boards. Um, but there's obviously a particular... Um, situation that arises for certain institutions. They've made their views very clear, and I think the government uh, would be open-minded about going away and considering that, uh, that, that uh, evidence uh, very carefully. But the 120 does come from the review, which is the substantive evidence base from which many of the, well, all of the provisions in the bill largely were inspired by. So, so you'll be taking those comments away and looking at possible amendments at stage two to make the bill more flexible to meet those yeah. particular institutions' needs? I think all I can say today is that those comments will be respectfully considered and, and, and are, are there with many of the other comments that have been collected through the evidence that, that it would be for ministers to decide on any action. Okay. Okay. Liam? Going on from that, I mean, it, it, it relates to this, it relates to the point about the, the, the governing bodies and indeed a number of other elements of this. From the, the round table we had this morning, it was very clear that the plea from the sector was that a one-size-fits-all approach is, is, is wholly inappropriate, reflecting the diversity of the sector. I think the conundrum for us scrutinising a piece of legislation is legislation isn't very good at making those distinctions and, and allowing for anything other than a one-size-fits-all. So what kind of assurance can you give the committee that on this issue and indeed on the other issues um, that the Scottish Government is alive to the, the real risks inherent in a one-size-fits-all approach for a sector as diverse as the Scottish HE sector is? It's a difficult question. I mean, I, I, I suppose that um, thinking about why the bill is happening, you know, the, the, the corollary of that is there are risks in not having the improvements, that there's actually not, that the, the governance arrangements aren't ideal. But to address that question, and Ailsa, I wonder, because there's obviously provision, and this goes back to the secondary legislation, there's, there's ability in the Act to make different um, provision for different institutions, is that correct? Yes, it would be possible, um, not in relation to the, 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 the composition of the governing body it's set out, that's already set out in the, the legislation, uh, and the same for the academic board. The, in terms of the regulation making powers that are there, there is possibility of making different provision for, for different purposes, that would apply particularly in relation to the, the to Section 1 on the elected chairs. If that was to remain in the bill and, and be dealt with in regulations, then it, it's possible to do different provision for different institutions. But, yes. yeah. the, the, the question of, I mean, there will be, a, 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 I suppose, a, a point of, of debate and tension between some people say one size fits all and others will say consistency, transparency and inclusivity. And I think that in some ways it's, it's, it's not a, a large bill, but obviously several of the, the uh, provisions within it have, are, are subject to quite a lot of discussion. So, so the level of um, consistency is, is an, on, on a very limited number of matters. And in those matters that were not taken forward in the code, uh, such as elected chairs and uh, the composition of governing bodies as set out in the bill, the, the, the code and these link with what was in the original review report. So it, I suppose what, what I'm saying, it's not a, a great, a great uh, array of new uh, standard uh, features for, for, for the sector. It's, 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 it's quite a focused series of measures within a focused Just bill. taking one example from this morning, the, the, what accountability, transparency and participation looks like in the Conservatoire is going to be very, very different, one imagines, from what it's going to look like in an institution like um, the University of Edinburgh or the University of Glasgow. And I think for those of us who are now looking at a bill um, uh, that, that is, is seeking to legislate for things that we all would hope are a feature of, of, of governance in our, our universities. The real risk is in the unintended consequences of this works for 80, 90 percent of the cases, but is wholly inappropriate for, for, for the others. How, how we come up with a piece of legislation at the end of this process that doesn't cause that sort of uh, either unintended or, 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 or fully anticipated, but deemed to be um, a price worth paying for the effects it will have on the, on the majority is, is 
is well, is a real dilemma, and and, and I think <coughs> an understanding from the Scottish Government that one should only be legislating where that is the only means of achieving the desired outcome has to be uh, an assurance that we're, we're seeking, not, not necessarily just from you as officials. I mean, clearly this is a, as much and probably more a matter for the yeah. Cabinet Secretary, but do you understand the, the position we find ourselves in? Well, I, I mean, I take on board everything that you said, and I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary would, would take on board all of that too as the bill progresses. Thank you. Colin. Thank you, I'd like to look at the, the roles of rectors. Um, Various organisations have uh, given submissions about the bill's impact on rectors, but I find it very difficult to actually get a sense of what the role is in terms of a rector. There seems to be different, rec different uh, bodies seem to have slightly different, for want of a better word, job descriptions for this. If this bill's passed, what exactly will the role of a rector and a chair be? How will they, how, how will they complement each other? Um, the question is posed quite a difficult one because we're right in the middle of a design discussion, if you like, on what elected chairs, how it will run, and the, 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 the role of rectors is all part of that. So it said, in some ways, if I was to, it would be get, you know, jumping ahead guesswork of mine alone, and we're in an active discussion, and I wouldn't like to try and design something without taking everyone we're talking to with us. Um, but I do obviously want to answer your question. I mean, do, it's not possible for me today to say, if there were to be t two figures in the model, how exactly it would work. I mean, what, the, what rectors do in different universities, uh, and, uh, and they are all universities, it's important to say how, not all higher education institutions are universities. Um, they, uh, and I'll, they also, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, 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 they have the legal right to preside at court. And generally, I think in recent history, the, the chairing, the substantive chairing, has been carried out by the, the vice convener, senior governor, and the, the presiding at court has been alongside that. Sometimes certain um, rectors may have had more of a, an active role in that other job, and sometimes uh, you know a, a lesser role. Um, what the cabinet secretary has been clear about, and she's insisted on this, is that there's absolutely no intention to abolish the role of rector. The role of rector is a respected institution uh, in, 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 in Scottish life and university life. But yes, in, in terms of how the, the exact interaction would be in future, that is a dialogue we are still in. And, and I think that in the letter to the committee, the Cabinet Secretary outlined uh, an aim that at stage two there would be clarity on that. But if I was to say now, it would be my estimate while there's still discussion going on with stakeholders. I mean, the Cabinet Secretary did uh, acknowledge the concerns around the role of rectors, and she said, we'll seek, we will seek to minimise and consider removal of any features of the model selected that could impinge on the role of rector. Um, but there, there's no one role for the rector because no, there are different, yeah. uh, there's different, uh, sure. different models. I think I, can, I think I can answer that. I th what, what, I'm not to second guess, but I think specifically what would be at the nub of that would be this question of the legal right to preside slash chair the court. That is the specific feature that she would be referring to there. Because I think, as far as I understand the representations from rectors and the concerns, that is the principal concern that, um, that, that would be any alteration to that feature of the rector's role. So she's very alive to these thoughts, the, these, these views that have been shared, and would seek to minimise uh, any at all. Uh, it's actually in the bill. The, 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 the bill had to accommodate, depending on what the model would be, that there's a consequential amendment in one of the schedules, that that role under a certain model would be modified. But as you say, she's made it clear that, 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 that it's, it's uh, not at all an intention of the government to undermine the role of, of rectors or abolish that, that post. <coughs> Will that mean that the role of rectors will then stay individual to the institutions that they are currently with? In other words, there won't be one single uh, definition of what the rector does? No, the, the, there will only be rectors in a statutory sense in the institutions that already have them. Elected chairs, I mean, you could use the term rector, but there's no legislation for rector across all HEIs. The roles would stay... Um, subject to the dialogue and what the final elected chair's model is, but there'd be no government intention to alter the role in each of the, the ancients and Dundee where rectors are. So the differences Just would still remain? 
uh, individual the, to the yes. institutions to which the rectors are. The, the different. Uh, uh, what was in all the statute, uh, the, the governing instruments of, of ancient universities and Dundee at the moment wouldn't be altered. Uh, so, so the, the variety in what the rector exactly does, in terms of the basis there at the moment. But what, what I'm trying to say is that it's a complicated issue. But the way elected chairs, statutory elected chairs, would operate is still in dialogue and that until that's ended, we can't know exactly what the model will operate like in practice, but there's no intention and, and no likelihood that there'll be any interference with um, the detailed description of rector in each ancient university. So on that basis, the rector could still, if, if, uh, if it's uh, permitted within the model in that particular university, they could still opt to uh, chair the governing body. <laughs> that's, that's, quite, that's quite possible, but as I say, we're still in the middle of the dialogue to, to frame the model. Um, I mean, ultimately, the regulations could theoretically be used in future should the bill become an act, but that, that dialogue is very active at the moment with the aim to frame an amendment at stage two for the model. I'm obviously concerned about the potential for a, a conflict between the role of the chair and the role of the rector in terms of the rector's right to chair the governing body. Yes, and I think they would need to be very, very clear on that. Because at the moment, the rectors have the right to preside at court, but they don't often in, 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 in all institutions substantively carry out the role of chair. Um, but they could. It, w w statutorily, they have that right, yes, at the moment. So it looks like there's still quite a bit of work to be done there. But, well, I, w I wouldn't underestimate the dialogue that still needs to be had, yes. Okay. Thanks, Colin. Um, can I, sorry, so Mr. Wright, can I just follow up on this? Because I, I thought I was following it up until nearer the end there, and, 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 I, and you kind of lost me, because um, I'm now confused about what the, in reality, I know we're still in discussion, and, and I accept it's not finalised, but, and excuse, us, excuse me if I've got this completely wrong, but if we have elected chairs, how can a rector retain the right to chair? How, how does that operate? It, it, it's, well, again, it, I, I, I have absolutely no way to appear evasive about answering the question. It's just we're in the dialogue. We're looking at some of these design complexities at the moment. But obviously, rectors have been very clear and very vocal about their um, concerns about any adjustment at all to, to their role as set out in statute. Mm -hmm. So we are picking through these issues of great detail and that issue that you, you, you raise is one that we're looking at at the moment. Um, we are talking to stakeholders and are um, confident that um, a solution can be found to that. But uh, the challenge that you present as an issue is not one that we're unaware of and we're working through it at the moment. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I'm sure you are and I, I did put caveats into my question about, I understand that's the, the case, you're still working through it, but I'll, I'll be fascinated to find out how you square that particular circle. Because it seems to me, you, you, I can't, I, at the moment I can't see a compromise between the ability of a rector to have the right to chair and having an elected chair. I can't see where the compromise is there. No, and I, and I take what you say and, and note it very carefully, and I think it probably would be fair to say that the committee will be We'll keep in touch with the committee closely on this because we'll be if, fascinated to find if, out what if the we said today about is. you know in terms of um, um, work which would be ideally uh, lead to a stage two amendment, I think that close dialogue on this and the lead up, given the time scale for the bill, would be something that, that would be important to do with the committee. It would be welcome. Th thank you very much, um, Mary Scanlon. Yes, um, on the point of academic freedom, I did ask a, a question earlier. Um, and from the policy memorandum, the definition of academic freedom has expanded explicitly includes the freedom to develop and advance new ideas and innovative um, proposals. It's also in the explanatory notes. I, I'm just wondering, in terms of uh, academic freedom and you know, freedom to express and bring forward new ideas, what will this bill do that's not happening already? to clarify and strengthen the existing definition of academic freedom by being more explicit about what it includes. Right, could you be more explicit with me then? I mean, just telling me the bill's more explicit, I wouldn't have bothered asking the question had, you know, if it had been explicit. I mean, every single higher education institution doesn't think it's explicit and they're far smarter than I am. 
So I'm sorry, convener, but just saying it's explicit, I actually find that quite insulting. I'm looking for an answer. What will happen in the bill just, again, I don't, I mean, that doesn't happen now? You're quite right to, to challenge. I think that was. I'd like not, an answer. Absolutely, and I think you should answer the question. I want about, to try and understand it. Yes, Mary, I'm trying, I'm trying to be, a, be of assistance to you. Thank you. I think it is, you know, um, it's not a clear answer just to say, you know, what you've just said. No. But at the same time, Mary, I, I'd rather you didn't use some of the language, but just be a little bit cautious. With your language. I just prefer if you didn't be as, as, as challenging with some of your language. Well, if to I the can witnesses. just get an answer, that would be I, fine. I, that's what I'm trying to get. Yeah. Well, to go back to, go back to the question, um, I don't think anyone would claim that this modest adjustment is a, is a huge advancement. I think Mary, a uh, senior from, from UCU, said it was a welcome enhancement. Um, there are two things that does, apart from the expansion to explore new ideas, to sort of modernise it. The other is that there's a, a, a change, um, which, which we've read the comments on, that, that um, institutions must uh, seek to aim to uphold the, the academic freedom. I think that's a change from before it was uh, aimed to aspire to uphold. Now, that's a paraphrasing. But there's a strengthening of the duty on the institution to uphold the academic freedom. Uh, and I think that's something that's been welcomed by academics and others. So, no, I, it's not a quantum leap here. I, I think it's fair to say it's a modest adjustment to the existing 2005 statutory um, definition and also that there's a slight strengthening of the, the expectation in the institution to uphold the academic freedom of its staff. Well, could I just finally ask, can I... Could you give me examples of higher education institutions in Scotland who have not been, been upholding academic freedom? Because I'm struggling to see why this modest enhancement is necessary. And, and if you could just, I know what your modest enhancement solution is, but I'm not sure what the problem is. Well, I, I, th I think the committee's letter to the Cabinet Secretary, which she answered, asked, have you got any? And I think we, we said in the letter, no, we can't cite any individual so specific cases. But the, the change to the law wasn't done to address lots of, of uh, uh, you know, unpleasant situations and strife in universities. It was actually just to make that modernised statement, influenced by the von Prindinsky Review and what they'd looked at in Ireland as well, which I think someone said earlier. But yeah, I wouldn't claim it's a, it's a quantum leap, but I think there is an important thing, and I, and I think some of the institutions don't, don't favour it at all, is to have the institution more in the place of, of, of actively you know, protecting and supporting academic freedom. And although it might not be important to some stakeholders, it seems to be quite important to, to quite a few. Liz? When international uh, bodies look at us and other institutions look at Scotland, they see our institutions as at the absolute cutting edge of knowledge exchange, of research, of uh, all kinds of developments within uh, education. They see us as first class, which is reflected in our league tables. Why do we need legislation to allow universities to have new ideas? Um, well, I, I think that the, the specific academic freedom is about the academics uh, uh, to, to express their new ideas. This is a protection of their academic freedom. It's not so much about the university's <coughs> reputation. It's to protect the individual academic to expand and, and their, their, their theories. If it's and not new about ideas. our academic reputation, then what on earth is it about? No, well, I think it's about the protection of the individual academic. It, the, 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 that part of the bill is not about advancing the corporate image of different institutions. It's just for a specific and different purpose. And I don't think, although that's not what you've asked me, I don't think it damages that. It's, uh, it's a very modest advancement of the existing statutory description. But Mrs Scanlon has just quoted to you uh, a suggestion that there is something that needs to be done to enhance uh, new ideas and, you know, in, in terms of doing something a little bit differently. What is it that we need to do that we are not doing already? Well, that's a huge strategic question about the future uh, direction of well, universities. I, don't, I, I wouldn't... It's at the heart of the bill, Mr well, 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 I wouldn't... Yeah, but I, I think if I take your question, it is, what, is, what are these new ideas that are going to further that success? I think that's a slightly different topic to what's in the bill. Although, to be fair, and, and I'm not trying to be evasive at all, you obviously you know, think that the bill actually jeopardises that future success. But you're asking me the question what those new ideas are. And I, uh, 
I, I, I think that's a different subject about new ideas well, about advancing higher education. Can we just turn it around a little bit then? Sense. What is it in the current system that in some way prevents universities doing what they would like to do to be at the cutting edge? What, what is wrong with the way in which we govern our universities that prevents certain things happening to allow us to flourish even more than we're doing This is today. just through the prism of academic freedom provisions. Correct. I don't think there's anything stopping universities, but what this provision is about is protecting the academic freedom of the individual academic to in their own work. It's individual focused rather than institution focused, uh, except in the sense that the institution must uh, itself uh, uphold the academic freedom of all relevant persons that the, that the bill sets out. But no, there's nothing stopping. I mean, it doesn't need to be said, but the government are uh, very, very, very um, uh, appreciative of, of, of Scotland's excellent universities and often takes the opportunity to say it. Liam? Yeah, I'm, <coughs> I'm struggling again that, to, to understand why it is that we're being asked to put into legislation a protection of a freedom that doesn't appear to be under threat. I mean, this again, I, I think I use this in relation to another bill we're scrutinising at the moment. It just seems to be a solution <coughs> searching for a problem. Um, I, I don't, well, Elsa, sorry, you want to come in, yeah. It's not a, it's not a new um, provision to, to, uh, in relation to academic freedom. It's uh, amending a, a current provision in the further and higher Indeed. education. Indeed, no, I mean, yes. I, I think the 2005 legislation very properly sets out. Um, academic freedom and, 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 and how that needs to be protected and safeguarded in, in our universities and colleges. And I don't think any of us have a, a problem with what is currently on the statute book. It's, it's the fact that we're being asked to put in, into further legislation uh, a protection of a freedom that, that nobody can point to the, uh, the immediate threat of. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, what's the legislation is all a question for, for ministers, but what I would say is that the consultation itself threw up support or neutral views on this, uh, set against some of the other provisions that had support, very few neutral views and strong opposition. So I think that the modest expansion of the existing statutory definition of academic freedom is something which the stakeholder evidence that we gathered was generally supportive of. But as I said earlier to the earlier question, it's not a, a quantum leap or a radical reworking of, of the statutory. No one would claim it was. Okay, thank you. I just want to ask one final question um, before we finish this uh, part of the committee meeting. We had uh, written evidence from uh, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities. Um, you may be aware of incidents um, that have been reported about the mistreatment of uh, Jewish students in particular and, and some Jewish academics. I just wondered um, what they've said is that they are concerned about the idea of widening the statutory definition of academic freedom without at the same time uh, including um, the ability to protect those who may suffer detriment from careless or malicious use of that freedom. In other words, the, the duty of care that are owed to students in universities or HEIs in general. What consideration has been taken into account of those incidents uh, in relation to the changes that you're suggesting to make with the ac definition of academic freedom? Um, of those, the specific in incidents indicated? You, you're unaware of the incidents I'm talking about. Um, I, yeah, well, I'm not aware of them through the, the, the terms of this, the submission. But there was a submission of evidence to the bill. There was a submission from, yes, from well, the Scottish Council of Jews. Yes, mm -hmm. and we, we, are, we are still, given the very, very, very large amount of evidence that was submitted, we're still working through all of them. But what I would say is that, that what you, you know, I think it's a very serious issue which should be taken very seriously. Before you got to the end of the question, what I was going to say is, and I think the letter to the committee outlined, that... Academic freedom doesn't give you um, immunity from the criminal law. The duty of care and the protection by the you know, law enforcement, by the institutions, uh, o overrides <coughs> that when it, when it strays into criminal activity. So it's not, it's not any way a free pass to say and do what you want if you break uh, uh, you know, equality laws, obscenity laws, or, or whatever laws. I'm not a lawyer else to perhaps expand on this. But no, I would say um, that the number of written submissions where our team are working through them. So no, I've, I've got to be honest, and I hadn't got to that personally myself yet to read that one, but it sounds like something we should make sure we scrutinise very carefully. It sounds an extremely serious issue. 
to it take. It is. So I just wonder if he also has got anything to add. Simply that, you know, as Stephen has said, academic freedom is not is not a sort of free pass to do anything you want. I mean, it is subject to other <coughs> uh, um, legal sanctions. So, it, you know, that's all. I think that's all I would want to add. Well, I'm sure, Mr. White, when you get the chance to read it, um, you'll uh, well, it's, it's Sincerely, it's a matter of priority. It's just that we've been going through a rather a large volume of, of, of the, the submissions that you received. And, and, and so have we. Um, so <laughs> uh, thank you all very much for coming along this morning. Um, can I ask you just to stay where you are just while we do the next piece of our work? Uh, I, I, our next item on the agenda is to consider subordinate legislation um, as listed on our agenda. Do members have any comments on the instrument? Does the committee therefore agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on the instrument? Is that agreed? Thank you very much. As we have previously agreed to take the next item in private, I now close the meeting to the public.